Welcome to Double Portion Inheritance with Maria Marola and Gary Wold, brought to you by DoublePortionInheritance.com. Since 1981, Maria heard the call of Yahuwah to become a watchman to the House of Yisrael and to those within the traditional Christian church. She was instructed to warn them against the false doctrines and pagan traditions of men. After 25 years of studying scripture, the word of Yahuwah came to Maria again in 2007 as she was called out of the corporate world to become a full-time intercessor and prophetic teacher. The name of the ministry, Double Portion Inheritance, was given to her after she received the revelation of the two houses of Israel from Ezekiel 37:16. The mission of this ministry is to bring together the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph for the return of the Messiah, Yahushua. And now, Maria Marola. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Today is November the 6th, 2021, and uh, we are going to be answering the question, will animal sacrifices continue in the millennium? Um, and be, but be, before we get started, I just wrote a new blog, and I was up all night working on this. Uh, but I really feel like I need to kind of address the, some of these questions. It's called Six Common Myths about the temple, the sacrifices, and the abomination. And I've been hearing a lot of these misconceptions lately, and I feel like these are really important uh, to set the record straight about some of these things because I think a lot of people aren't going to be ready for what's going to happen with, you know, the abomination of desolation showing up in the temple in Jerusalem. And, you know, so there, there are some things that I feel like I need to lay the groundwork first. So I'm just going to run through this. I don't, I'm not saying we're going to have time for all three blogs because we're probably not, but I'm going to kind of skip around a little bit. Okay. So I'm going to pray, uh, start out with prayer. Father Yahuwah, we love you so much. We worship you, Abba. We glorify your name. Your name is Kadosh Holy. And we just thank you so much for your Shabbat that you've given us a day that we can rest and we can come into your presence and we can seek your face. And Father, we just come to you now. We ask you for the blood of Yahushua to cleanse us, to wash us from all sin and all unrighteousness. We confess all of our sins, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh. We ask you, to forgive us for all of our sins. Thank you so much for dying for us and for making a way that we might come boldly into your throne of grace to find mercy and help in time of need. And we do, Abba Yahuwah, ask you to pour out your Ruach HaKodesh upon each and every one of us. You said in the last days you would pour out your Ruach on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And even upon my handmaidens, you said, I will pour out my spirit, you said. And so, Father, we believe that we are living in probably the greatest time in history, even though it's also a very scary time in history. Um, we are privileged to be part of your two end-time corporate witnesses. We are privileged to be able to witness in a time when most of the world has gone mad. And so we ask you to send us out as your witnesses to, uh, you know, be that light, that beacon in a dark world. And just, just speak to us by your spirit, by your Ruach, as we embark on this study today. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, six common myths about the temple, the sacrifices, and the abominations. So I'm going to start with that. Okay, myth number one. Okay, um, I frequently hear believers declaring that the snake bite is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and therefore we are already in the great tribulation. Okay, my response to myth number one, I do agree that this, it, this snake bite is just one layer of fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. However, there will also be a literal fulfillment of the abomination of desolation 
with Solomon's temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem and the image of the beast will be set up therein. Okay. So the myth is not that, you know, I do believe this is a fulfillment of the AOD. I'm going to call it the AOD, you know, abomination of desolation. And I'm going to call the other MOTB. Okay. Mark of the beast. Uh, so this snake bite is indeed the MOTB. It, it is not merely a precursor. Historically, the AOD is not the same thing as the MOTB. The abomination of oh, AOD occurred two other times in history in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes when he set up an image of Zeus in the temple. Uh, it also had an intermediate fulfillment with the Roman general Titus, who erected an image of Jupiter. Uh, that's the Roman name for Zeus, just before the Roman siege in 70 AD. So the AOD was spoken of by the prophet Daniel, and it pertains to the literal temple in Jerusalem. Okay, primarily that's the, you know, that is the, the ultimate fulfillment of the AOD. However, in these last days, it also applies to these snake bites as well. Thus, it has a dual fulfillment. The MOTB is a separate thing from the AOD, historically speaking. Okay. In other words, in the past, uh, we've had other AODs. Okay. But the MOTB is specifically something that pertains to the human body. However, there is an overlap where the AOD and the MOTB are coinciding in these last days. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, I am probably the first person to identify these snake bites as the AOD last year in March when I first created this meme. Okay. So I don't know if you guys can see this. I hope you can see it. But over here, I have an illustration. It says the first abomination of desolation, the first AOD. And you can see an altar with the four horns on the corners. And there's an image of Zeus. There's a, a little pig right there about to get slaughtered. And it says Antiochus Epiphanes coin. Okay, his image was on the coin. Uh, the image of the beast, a precursor to the image of the beast. Revelation 13, 14 says that they should make an image to the beast. So in 167 BCE, the common era, the troops of the Greek Antiochus Epiphanes, the fourth desolated the temple and he did away with the daily sacrifices on Kislev, 25 that it happened to land on December 25th 167 BC Antioch has set up an image or image of Zeus which in Roman they call it Jupiter on a horn or on the wing of the altar resembling himself he then offered up a pig an unclean creature on the altar okay Daniel 9 27 says upon the wing of the abomination shall come one who desolates. Incidentally, this word epiphania, which Antiochus gave himself this title, epiphania in Greek, it adds up to 666. It has the numerical value of 666, and it means God with us. Okay. All right. Here's the second fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. You see the you see the altar again, okay? This time, it's Nero Caesar's image on the, on the coin. And they set up the eagle standards. They set up an image of Caesar. And once again, they offered up swine's flesh. But this was in a different year. It was the year 70, the common era or AD. The troops of the Roman general Titus desolated the temple and did away with the daily sacrifice on the 9th of Av uh, in 70 AD or CE, the common era. Then they set up their Roman eagle standards as well as a graven image of Nero Caesar, who claimed 
that he was a reincarnation of Zeus or Jupiter born on December 25th. So you see the pattern here. Antiochus claimed that he was the manifestation of the Roman god or the Greek god Zeus on December 25th. And the same thing happened again with uh, General Titus setting up an image of Caesar who was claiming that he was a reincarnation of Zeus also born on December 25th. Nero, Caesar's name adds up to 666 in Hebrew, Gematria. Okay, so there's been two fulfillments already, intermediate fulfillments of the abomination of desolation. And thank goodness that Yahuwah gives us these patterns from the past that we can reference, right? Because if we didn't have patterns from the past, how would we know what to look for in the future? And now here is the future fulfillment. Right here you see a syringe, and I've listed some of the ingredients. Fetal, cow serum, monkey kidney cells, porcine, pig gelatin, porcine, pig arginine, DNA from pig, uh, circoviruses, uh, PCV is what they call that, canine, dog, kidney cell protein, says human embryonic aborted a baby lung cultures, aborted human diploid cell cultures. Okay, so we can see that this is definitely an unclean thing, just like the swine's flesh that was offered up on the altar of the temple in previous times. Only this time the temple is the human body. Okay, and as you can see down here, I said scenes are an abomination. Oh, I shouldn't have said that word. <laughs> Snake bites are an abomination to the human temple. Okay, so the abomination that makes desolate. And as you can see, there's scripture references here from Leviticus 11, 7. Um, the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven footed, yet he choose not the cud. He is unclean to you. Leviticus 11, 43, you shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, neither shall you make yourselves unclean with them that you should be defiled thereby. Deuteronomy 14, 8, and the swine, because it divides the hoof, yet choose not the cud, it is unclean to you. You shall not eat. Okay, and, and in parentheses, I use the word consume. Because when you look at that word eat um, in the Hebrew, it does include cons to consume. So it's not only to just put it in your mouth. It's to consume it, ingest it in some way. Okay, so, but there's, because there's some people out there, Torah teachers that are acting like because it's injected, it's not the same thing as eating it. No, it's far worse if it's injected into the bloodstream. Believe me far worse. Um, so that's ridiculous. Eating it, consuming it, injecting it, same thing. It's unclean. Um, so we're, we're not to consume of their flesh nor touch their dead carcass. Okay. Now you think if it goes into your bloodstream, you're not touching it. Come on, don't be ridiculous. Um, Acts 15, 20 says, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. Okay, um, so aborted fetal tissue, that is blood. That is things that are strangled. You know, they, they use strangulation uh, often in abortion. Uh, human and animal blood contains DNA, okay? Revelation 13, 16, it says through 17 and he causes all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the mark of the beast or the number of his name and here you see the temple coin with um president you know djt and you can see his his image is on the temple shekel and his name in 
gematria does add up to 666 in Roman numerals and also in computer ASCII. Okay. And so this was, I made this meme last year, uh, just, uh, just before the, the, uh, you know, the jab was rolled out and I was, see, I was already recognizing this as an abomination that desolates the human temple. But that doesn't mean that there's not going to be a literal temple in Jerusalem as well. Okay. So that's, that's key because people are saying, oh, well, here it is. This is the abomination of desolation. We don't, there's not going to be one built in Jerusalem. We don't need to wait for one to be built in Jerusalem. This is it. No, 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 no. You, you, we are not there yet. People are saying we're in the great tribulation. We're not in the great tribulation yet. And I'll prove to you with scripture why we're not. Okay. And here's some other ingredients that I think are important for people to know. Thimerosal, uh, mercury, et ethanol, antifreeze, uh, aluminum, formaldehyde, acetone, barium, E. coli. I mean, and there's a lot worse things that we're finding out now. We're finding out about the hydra vulgaris. We're finding out about the graphene oxide. We're finding out about so many wicked things that are in it. Okay. So we're, we can't be in the great tribulation yet because our Messiah told us precisely when it will begin. Okay. In Matthew 24, 14. He says, when you therefore shall see and see, that's important. See, we have to see it and we have not seen it with our eyes yet. We can't go around the world and collect, you know, uh, what do you call it? X-rays and MRIs on every single person that's taken the, you know, the snake bite and see the abomination inside their bodies. No, this is going to be something televised. This is going to be something that we're all going to be able to see it. Okay. So right here in Matthew 24, 21, he says, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So we're not in the great tribulation yet. When we see this abominable image stand in the holy place, at that moment, the two witnesses, the corporate two witnesses, will begin their 1,260 days of ministry. Concurrently, the false Messiah will begin his 42 months of speaking blasphemies, great things and blasphemies against the Most High. Okay, so the ministry of the two witnesses and the ministry of the false Messiah are going to be running concurrently. Okay, a lot of people think that they're back to back. No, they're not. They're going to be running concurrently. Okay, now let's take a look at the prophecies in Daniel, because this is important. People ignore these prophecies and they say, Oh, well, you know, the snake bite, that's the abomination of desolation. We don't, we don't have to wait for another one. So they think we're already here. Okay. And we're going to, the book of Daniel is going to show us that that's not the case. Okay. The, the daily sacrifices in the temple being taken away, taken away. This is, it's important to understand at this point that not all animal sacrifices were conducted for sin. Okay. People are confused about that. Even the Passover lamb sacrifice was to redeem the firstborn son. Okay. It, that's what it, what it was meant for. It was technically not considered a sin sacrifice because it was not done inside the temple. Okay. The only sacrifice that was done for the national sins of Israel was the Yom Kippur goat once per year by the high priest. Now, some people, I can already hear what you're asking. You're saying, but wait a minute. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? He's the lamb of Elohim who takes away the sins of the world. That's right. 
But what you have to understand is that when John, uh, the Baptist, the, the cousin of our Messiah, Yehukanan, when he uttered these words, he was actually pointing to Yom Kippur typology because our Messiah went into the wilderness for 40 days, but prior to that, he was washed in the Jordan River. Why did he do this? You see, everything he did was pointing us to the Yom Kippur twin goats. The high priest was supposed to wash himself first before performing the Yom Kippur sacrifice. Okay, so when John says, behold, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world, the, you know, he was actually using that word lamb to mean the Yom Kippur goat. And let me show you something here. Let's see, taketh away sin world. Find the passage. It's in John 1 29. Okay. And I'm going to look that up so we can see the word for lamb. 29. Lamb. Okay. Uh, 286. Amnos. Okay. Amnos. Let's see. I'm going to find the, the word. And Amnos. 286. Okay, so yeah, the, the primary word, a primary word, lamb, okay? But you have to understand that the goat and the lambs were actually synonymous with each other in the temple sacrifices because we are told um, for, for Passover, we could, we could use a goat or a lamb, okay? Right here in Exodus 12, 5, it says, your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Okay. So you could use either one for Pesach. Okay. Then in Leviticus 5, 6, it says, and he shall bring his trespass offering. Okay. Trespass offering unto Yahuwah for his sin. Okay. This is referring to a sin offering, which he, which he has sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. Leviticus 17, three says, what man soever there be of the house of Israel that kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp, or that kills it out of the camp. Um, so yeah, you could use either a goat or a lamb for Passover or even for Yom Kippur. Okay, so back to the blog. So it's important to understand that 40 days before Messiah entered the synagogue and read the Isaiah 61 scroll that was in Luke chapter four. He, this was on Yom Kippur. And how do we know that when he read this, uh, you know, in the synagogue on, on, in Luke chapter four, that this was on Yom Kippur? Well, the way we know is because he uses Yom Kippur language. He says that he's come to announce the acceptable year. Luke 4, 18, right? It says right here, the spirit, the Ruach of Yahuwah is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of Yahuwah. This is Yom Kippur language. And it's it's in Isaiah chapter 12, uh, in uh, Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 uses the same kind of language. It talks about a fast. Where have we fasted and you do not see it? 
Wherefore have we afflicted our soul? Are we not commanded to afflict our soul for Yom Kippur? Yes. So afflicting your soul is associated with fasting, even though some people try and say that we don't have to fast for Yom Kippur. But that's for another teaching. I'm not going to go down that that rabbit trail today about fasting for Yom Kippur. But the point is, we know that Yom Kippur is being spoken of in Isaiah 58. An acceptable day. Here we go. Isaiah 58, 5. He says, is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and an acceptable day? Okay, to Yahuwah. So an acceptable day has to do with a jubilee year. It has to do with a jubilee year. Okay, and, and that word in Hebrew is Ratzon, okay? So this is how we know that our Messiah read the Isaiah 61 scroll on Yom Kippur. And 40 days earlier, when his cousin John baptized him, that was on the first of Elul, the first day of the sixth Hebrew month, Elul. Okay, so when he went into the wilderness to fast and pray, he was portraying the pattern of the Yom Kippur scapegoat. See, when he gets baptized, he's representing the sacrificial goat because baptism is a symbol of death. We read this in Romans chapter six. The apostle Shaul or Paul tells us that baptism is a picture of death. He says that when we are immersed or baptized or mikvahed, we are being immersed into his death. So when you go under the water, you are symbolically dying to the old sinful man, the old sinful nature. And when you come up out of the water, you are symbolically resurrecting and changing into the new man. Okay, so when he was being baptized, he was technically showing us himself as the Yom Kippur sacrificial goat, that he was the one that was going to be killed as not only the Yom Kippur goat, but the lamb, the Passover lamb. See, there's like the Passover lamb and the Yom Kippur goat are like two bookends, right? Passover and Yom Kippur are like two bookends. They both uh, combined fulfill the same purpose. And then what happens? The Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, uh, leads him into the wilderness. Okay. And that's exactly what's supposed to take place with the scapegoat. The scapegoat was supposed to be led into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. Well, in that instance, the hand of the fit man was the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. Okay. So, the evening and the morning sacrifices that they did in the temple were not done for sin. Okay, understand that the evening and the morning sacrifices were conducted as an act of worship. They were conducted daily as an act of worship to Yahuwah. Additionally, the priests were commanded to partake of the meat offerings for their food. Therefore, the daily sacrifices served two purposes. They were an act of worship and they were intended as food to sustain the priests. Okay. So there are three places in scripture in the book of Daniel where we are told that the future anti-Messiah will take away the daily sacrifices in the temple and he will subsequently set up an idolatrous image. Okay. Daniel 8, 11 says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. Now, there's a well-known Torah teacher, 
Um, I mean, I'll just say his name because it's, you know, he makes it public what he teaches. It's not like I'm gossiping. I'm just telling you what he teaches. He, you know, he's made it public. He says his name is Matthew Nolan. He tries to debunk this passage of scripture by claiming that the phrase taken away means to exalt, to lift up, to raise up. Okay. Now, by twisting the definition of taken away, he falsely claims that the act of performing the daily sacrifices in the temple is a sin against Yahuwah. People, that is categorically false. When the anti-Messiah comes on the scene and takes away the daily sacrifice and instead sets up an abomination of desolation, the sin is in the taking away of the daily sacrifice and then the subsequent setting up of the abomination. So let's test his theory by looking up the word in Hebrew. The term taken away is defined in the Hebrew Strong's Concordance. Uh, it's number H7311. It's the word room, like you, you know, pronounce a room in your house, right? Room. Now it says to be high, to rise or to raise. I see where he's he's coming from. He's saying that taken away means to rise or to raise. Okay, so far he's right. Bring up exalt. Um, but then it goes on. It says to be haughty, okay, presumptuously, proud, and right here it says take away, breed worms. So it, it has more than one meaning, okay? It has more than one application. But then the phrase cast down, let's look at that. The term cast down is defined in the Hebrew Strong's Concordance as shalak. It's number H7993, shalak. It means to throw out, to throw down, to throw away, to cast away, to hurl, to pluck, to throw. Okay, so the whole passage in context is saying that the false Messiah will magnify himself and by him he will take away the daily sacrifice and the place of sanctuary you know, the altar will be cast down. So what he's doing is a sin. But, you know, this guy Nolan tries to say that that the sin is not in the taking away of the sacrifice. OK, so he's he's misguided on that. OK, he's not really being honest with the text because, look, there's two other places where the same thing is being spoken of. Let's look at them. Daniel 11.31, it says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination that makes desolate. Okay, now in this passage, the phrase take away is a different word than in Daniel 8.11. It's this other Hebrew word. It's number H5493. And the word is sur, sur. Okay. And it means to decline, to depart, to lay away, um, to pluck away, to put away, to rebel, to remove, to revolt, to withdraw, to be without. Isn't that interesting that in Daniel 8, 11, it uses a different word for take away. But when you get to Daniel eleven thirty one 31 and Daniel 12, 11, it uses this other word for take away. It's this word sur. Well, Mr. Nolan only uses the Daniel 8, 11 reference. He doesn't give us the meaning of the word for, for take away in these other two passages. So he's not being honest about the text. Daniel 12, 11, And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Okay, so people are confused and there's Christians 
and even Hebrew roots people that think that taking away the daily sacrifice is a good thing. They think, well, isn't, you know, Yahushua the ultimate sacrifice? Why should we start offering animal sacrifices again? That's an abomination. I've heard Hebrew roots people say that. I'm like, no, the daily sacrifice is not an abomination. The daily sacrifice is an act of worship. The sin occurs when the false Messiah takes away the worship of Yahuwah, takes away worship from Yahuwah and forces the worship to be on himself. Okay, so this misunderstanding is widespread in the Hebraic community. People think that the daily sacrifices, when they build the third temple in Jerusalem and they begin the daily sacrifice, that that's a sin. It is not a sin. It's an act of worship. Okay? It's not meant, the daily sacrifices were not intended to atone for sin. They were an act of worship. Okay? All right, so. President Donald Trump has been asked, President DJT has been asked by the Zionists to build Solomon's temple, and I believe that he will. They have even minted his image on the coin, the temple shekel. And as you can see, his, his image is right next to King Cyrus. And here you got Cyrus, an image of Cyrus, which is a lion with a sword you know, and you, on this side, you got the eagle standards. Isn't that what, what Nero Caesar set up in the temple in 70 AD? The eagle standards, okay? And on the coin, it says, and he charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, okay? So they use this passage of scripture where it says, he charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem. Now, why would Trump's image be on this coin if he's not going to build the temple? Okay. So it's right in plain sight. You can't miss it. Okay. All right. So myth number two, people are saying the Levitical priesthood is done away with and the animal sacrifices are also done away with since Messiah died on the tree and resurrected. Okay. Here's my response to myth number two. The first thing I would like to point out is that the only thing that changed with the new covenant or the renewed covenant was the role of the high priest, not the role of the regular priests, only the role of the high priest, the Kohen Haggadol. In fact, once when you read the whole book of Hebrews with this new understanding, you're going to read the book of Hebrews in a completely different way by understanding that the whole book is addressing the role of the high priest, not the regular priests. OK, the regular priests will still be functioning under Messiah. In the new millennium, Yahushua will be the high priest. Okay, understand that there's going to be two priesthoods functioning in the millennium. King David had two priesthoods functioning together side by side in David's tabernacle. He had the priesthood of the sons of Zadok. They represent the Melchizedek priesthood. And he also had the sons of Aaron, the Aaronic priests working together, the Levites. Okay. Both priesthoods were functioning together. You see, all through the millennium, you're going to have those that are in their immortal bodies I believe those of us that are part of the bride, we're going to be changed into immortality. We're going to be serving Yahushua as his kings and priests 
in our immortal bodies. And then there's going to be another group of people who did not accept our Messiah until that day when he lands his feet on the Mount of Olives. The bride's going to be caught up to meet him in the air on the day of uh, trumpets, on the Feast of Trumpets. Then there's going to be 10 more days where those in Jerusalem who didn't accept him yet, they're going to go by the oil of his name. Just like the foolish virgins were told to go by the oil, there's going to be an outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And, you know, he says in Zechariah 12, 10, they will look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as more as one mourns for his only son. There is a remnant in the, in the book of, uh, in Zechariah, there's a remnant of from the house of Judah, the Jewish people living in the land right now, the scriptures tell us one third of them will be saved and the other two thirds will be destroyed. Okay. Now here's an article I found online. It's called David among the priests, seeing the Royal priesthood of David in the book of first Chronicles. This is an excellent, excellent article. I started reading this early this morning while I was writing this um, blog, okay? Um, and, you know, I don't have time to read the whole thing. But, it, you know, it really talks about how David, King David, um, although he was from the tribe of Judah, he was clothed with the linen ephod, okay? David's city became the home of the ark. Um, David was a prophetic type of Messiah. David's repeated actions evidence his priesthood. Okay, so David was from the tribe of Judah, and yet he functioned as a priest, as a high priest. Okay, so David had both. He had both the Levites, okay, uh, the sons of Aaron, the Levites, and he had the Zadok, the sons of Zadok. So, you know, David's tabernacle is a foreshadowing of when our Messiah comes back. Both priesthoods are going to function together. During that thousand years, there's those that made it into the quote unquote rapture or harpazo on the Feast of Trumpets, and those of us who make it in will have our incorruptible bodies. But there's going to be another group of people who are like the foolish virgins. They missed their chance to go into the marriage. But during those 10 days of awe, you know, Smyrna is told they would have to suffer tribulation for 10 more days. The, the name Smyrna in Revelation 2.10, means strengthened for myrrh, okay? Strengthened for myrrh. And if you understand what myrrh is, it myrrh is a spice or an essential oil that they used for purifying. They used it for purification. They used it as an embalming fluid to prepare a dead body. And there was one other person in history who strengthened herself with myrrh before going to meet the king. And that was Queen Esther. Okay. For six months, she prepared herself with myrrh. And she was of the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin of the kingdom of Judah. Okay. So she was a Yehudi, a Yehudia. That means a Jewess. And we see the pattern there. Smyrna, I believe, is referring to those that are Jews. They're obedient to the Torah. They didn't take the mark. They don't worship the beast. They're obedient to the Torah to the best of their knowledge and understanding. But they and they're waiting for the Messiah to come from heaven. They're not they don't believe that the false Messiah in the temple is the real Messiah. 
They know that he's not. But they don't know his name. They're still calling him Hashem. They're still calling him Adonai. Okay? Because what did he say to Philadelphia? He commended them because he said, you have not denied my name. He didn't say that to Smyrna. The only thing he said to Smyrna is, I know your works and your charity and your tribulation, you know, and, and so he commends them for their good works, but that's all. But he tells Smyrna they have to suffer tribulation for 10 days. But Philadelphia has an open door that no man can shut. Why? He commends them for their good works and they have not denied his name. So Philadelphia has the double portion. They know him by name. They're intimate with him. They have the Ruach HaKodesh. They have the oil of his name. They're, the, they're like the wise virgins. But Smyrna, they're like the foolish virgins. You have to understand the foolish virgins, they're still virgins. They haven't been defiled by the mother harlot system. They're still spiritually virgins. And they are numbered by the number five. Because what does five represent? The five books of Moses. So the five foolish virgins, they're still obeying Torah. And, and the foolish wise virgins and the foolish virgins both obey Torah. And, and they're both virgins, meaning that they are undefiled by the mother harlot system. But the only difference between the foolish virgins and the wise virgins is that the wise virgins have the oil of his name. But the, but the foolish virgins do not have the oil of his name. Now, some of you might be saying, well, where are you getting this idea of the oil of his name? Well, here it is. Song of Solomon 1.3. It's right here. Because of the savor of your good ointments, your name is is as oil poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love you? Okay, right there. It tells us what the oil is. And Philadelphia has it by the Feast of Trumpets when the harpazo happens, what people call the rapture, the harpazo is the Greek word. It means to catch away, to snatch away to seize, okay? When the bride is caught up to meet him in the air and taken to heaven, we're only going to be gone for during those 10 days of awe. But the other half of the bride, the foolish virgins, Smyrna, they're going to be suffering for 10 days. And during those 10 days, they're going to realize they missed it. They missed their day of visitation. And they're going to get the revelation that, Yahushua is the Messiah and they're going to repent. And when they meet him on the Mount of Olives, they're going to mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. Okay. Now, this is important to understand. Our Messiah said in Matthew 5, 17 through 19, he says, think not that I am come to destroy the Torah, the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. And that the, what he says next is extremely important. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the Torah law till all be fulfilled. When does the present day heaven and earth pass away? Okay, right here, Revelation 21.1 says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Okay, now our Messiah said not one punctuation mark, not one jot or tittle. So we need to look at the meaning of the jot and the tittle. Okay, let's look at the meaning because you're going to be really floored when you see the meaning. Okay, so after the 1,000 year reign of Messiah here on earth, that's when the new heaven and the new earth will descend and the current heaven and earth will pass away. So this word for jot, 
jot and tittle. The word jot is this Greek word number G2503, iota. It's actually spelled iota, iota. Okay, it comes from a Hebrew origin, the 10th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it's the eighth letter in the Greek alphabet. And it means a very small part of something. The smallest part of something. So Yahushua is basically saying, not even the, the most smallest, the, the most seemingly insignificant part of the law and prophets is going to pass away. Not None of it is done away with. Even the most seemingly tiny part of the Torah, it's still in effect. Okay. Now that's the word for tittle. The word for tittle is this other Greek word. Karaya, it's karaya, and it means something horn-like. Now, that's interesting, something horn-like, okay? It comes from this other root word, charis, karas, and it means a horn, a horn. Now, that's important because check this out. In Daniel's prophecy, the term little horn in Hebrew is karen, the air, and it means a little trump, a little trump. Okay. A little trump. All right. So Yahushua said not one iota, not, not one tiny little thing or a horn will pass from the law or prophets. Okay. What is he, what he's really, it's really interesting because he could be hinting at the little horn, the anti-Messiah who takes away the daily sacrifice, okay? So the Greek word for pass away, it's parar komai, 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 ko, it's hard to pronounce this, parar komai, komai, okay? And it means to approach, it means to perish, to neglect, to transgress. Okay. So we could read Matthew 5 18 in this way. For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth is transgressed by the little horn, shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. So, really, if there's a hint in here about the transgression of the little horn. There's a hint, okay? 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, it says, for the mystery, okay, and that word mystery is a Greek word mysterion, which means a secret. It, it's, it has to do with esoteric religion, mystery Babylon. It says, for the mystery of iniquity, that word iniquity is anomia in Greek. It means lawlessness. The mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets... Okay, and, and that phrase, let's, means to possess, to seize upon. Um, only he who now possesses or seizes upon the temple will let until he be taken away. And that word to be taken means to be divided, to be finished. And then out of the way means in the middle, in the midst. So, Christians love to use this to say that, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to be raptured out of here before the Antichrist is revealed. That's not what's being portrayed here. The one who lets or possesses or seizes upon the temple, okay, right up until he is taken away. He takes away the daily sacrifice, okay? Um, so this word anomia comes from this word anamos, and it means not subject to Jewish law. Now, of course, the guy that wrote the Strong's Concordance, um, James Strong, he uses the term Jewish law. Really what he means is the law of Moses, but he's using, uh, you know, Jewish law. So he, he's not talking about the Talmud or the rabbinical law here. It's just the what he chose to use, right? The word anamos means not subject to Torah, okay? 
And then the phrase, he who now lets, is kat kateko. And it means to hold down. It means to possess, to seize upon, to withhold. The word, the phrase taken, genomai, means to generate, to be divided, to be finished, to be taken. Okay? And then the word out of the way is mesos, which means middle, midst. Okay? Now, to really get a deep understanding of who this mysterious restrainer is, I have a blog called Who Withholds the Man of Sin? And this is a very important blog. Uh, it's, it's too lengthy to go into. We'll be talking about this in subsequent weeks. So, you know, we are going to go over this. But just to give it to you in a nutshell, um, in Daniel 10, we are shown the mechanism by which different empires were installed. And it was Michael the archangel who would uh, fight against the powers and principalities in the heavenly realms. But when it was time to install a new empire, like the Grecian Empire or the Persian Empire, Michael would step out of the way and he would allow the next principality to be installed. Okay, so the mysterious restrainer is Michael, who withholds the man of sin. It's not the Holy Spirit being taken away. Because people you say that all the time. The Holy Spirit's going to be taken out of the way. How can the Holy Spirit be taken out of the way when the, the Spirit of Elohim, he, the, the earth is his footstool. The earth is his possession. That word footstool, if you look it up in the Hebrew, it means possession. It's not shaped like a footstool. People, people try to say that the earth is shaped like a footstool. No, it, that word footstool means possession. Okay. Why would you have to have something take the Holy Spirit out of the way? Mm -hmm. I mean, Yahuwah can remove himself. Sure. But no one moves any portion of him out of the way. Right. It's got to be something else. Yeah. And some people say it's the church that's taken out of the way. No, it's not talking about the rapture. It's not like talking about the church that's being taken out of the way. Okay. So myth number three, animal sacrifices will not be be conducted in the new millennium. So this is a myth. My response to myth number three. Here's my response to myth number three. Uh, they say animal sacrifices will not be conducted in the new millennium. Okay, so there is more than enough evidence to prove 100% of the Torah and the prophets will be in effect during the 1,000 year reign of Messiah. And this includes animal sacrifices. Just on that one scripture alone, Matthew 5, 17 and through 19. If our Messiah says not one iota, not one tiny punctuation mark of the law and the prophets will pass away until heaven and earth passes away. And we know that heaven and earth passes away when? After the millennium, after the thousand years are finished. If he said that every jot and tittle is still in effect, okay, until heaven and earth passes away, that has to include animal sacrifices, okay? Now, a careful reading of Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel 40 through 48 reveals that the Messiah, the prince, shall offer oblations in the new millennium. It's in Ezekiel 45, 7. Ezekiel 45, 16, and also in Ezekiel 48, 21. Now, some people argue that an oblation is not a blood sacrifice. It doesn't say that. Let's look it up in the Hebrew, the word oblation. It's uh, teruma, teruma, and it means a present as offered up, especially in sacrifice, as a tribute or a gift, a heave offering, a shoulder. There you go, a piece of meat. It's a shoulder, okay? Um, and it comes from this root word. Well, it's it's really this the uh, the plural word, okay? Taro tarumia, and it's a sacrificial offering, okay? It tells us that the prince, which is Yahushua, a prince is both 
He's a king and a priest. He's functioning in the same way as King David. Okay, he's going to offer up oblation. Isaiah Yeshayahu 16, 5 says, And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David. Okay, this is referring to the Mashiach. Amos 9.11, in that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. See, Yahushua will be the greater King David. He's going to be functioning as King David did. He's going to have both priesthoods working together. The Levites will function in their natural bodies during the millennium. And those that are kings and priests serving with Messiah, those of us that are his bride, we will put on incorruption and we will be part of his Melchizedek priesthood. Okay. Acts 15, 16 says it again. After this, I will return. I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. Now, you can't interpret this any other way. Yahushua is going to build the tabernacle of David, and he's going to offer sacrifices sacrifices, okay? Zechariah, Zechariah 6.11 says, then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Yahushua, Joshua, the son of Yahuzadek, okay? The Zedek part means righteous. It's the same Zedek that we see in Melchizedek, okay? Because Melchizedek is a compound word. Melki means king and Zedek means righteous. So the name Melki Zedek means king of righteousness. Okay. So the father's name is Yahuwah is righteous. He's the high priest. You know, this was talking about uh, a real contemporary high priest in those days, in the days of Zerubbabel, when the Jews came out of captivity they went back to Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple. So there really was a contemporary priest named Yahushua, who was the son of Yehudzadek, the high priest. But you see, this is also pointing us to a future high priest, uh, Yehudzadek. You know, Yahua is righteous and his son's name is Yehushua, Joshua. And then in Zechariah 6.12, it says, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaks Yahuwah of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of Yahuwah. Okay? And then in verse 13, it says it again, Even he shall build the temple of Yahuwah. And he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. This is so important because there are Torah teachers that are saying that there's not going to be a temple built in the new millennium. There's Torah teachers teaching this. And I'm like, do you not even pick up your Bible and read it? And you call yourself a Torah teacher? Like, really? Seriously? What did you do? Like, it just, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up that they're teaching this. And they're saying there's not going to be animal sacrifices in the new millennium. Why? Because, see, there's this pervasive thought, this pervasive idea. And it comes from the Christian church, but it's made its way into the Hebraic roots community. They say, well, Yahushua was the ultimate sacrifice. Therefore, we don't need animal sacrifices anymore. See, they assume that every single sacrifice that was done in the temple was for sin. No, 
That's not true. The only sacrifice that was considered a sin offering was the Yom Kippur goat once per year. That's it. All the other sacrifices had different purposes and different uh, different meanings behind it. As I said, the Yom, the the Passover lamb was meant to redeem the firstborn son, just like when Abraham offered up his son Yitzhak on the altar. He was about to slay his son, but instead there was a ram with his horns caught in a thicket. He offered up the substitutional ram. Okay, that was on Pesach. Okay, Pesach falls on the exact time that Abraham offered up his son. Okay, um, so animal blood never took sins away. Never did. Never did. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So stay with me. Animal blood never took away sins. Never, never, never. Okay. Um, in Yeshayahu, Isaiah 2, 3, it says, And many people should go and say, Come you and let us go up to the mountain of Yahuwah, to the house of Elohim, the Elohim of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of Yahuwah from Yerushalayim. So this is referring to the millennium. During the millennium, those of us who are part of the royal priesthood of Melchizedek, who are his kings and priests, we are going to be going to the nations and teaching the nations of his ways. And we will be inviting them to come to Yerushalayim. And we will be teaching them the Torah. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of Yahuwah from Yerushalayim. The same prophecies repeated in Micaiahu, in Micah 4.2. Okay. All right, next myth, myth number four. Okay, this is what Christians say, and even a lot of Torah people are saying this. Under the Mosaic Covenant, animal blood took away our sins. However, when Messiah died on the cross, animal blood no longer took away our sins, but our Messiah's blood became the ultimate fulfillment. Therefore, moving forward, no animal sacrifices are needed in the new millennium. Okay. Here's my response to myth number four. Animal blood never took away sins in the first place. Not even in the so-called Old Testament or the Tanakh. Okay. Animal blood only served as a prophetic picture of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You see, even in the Mo tabernacle of Moses, when those priests were performing their sacrifices, they were supposed to be receiving a prophetic picture of the lamb slain in eternity. Okay. They were already obsolete. Even in the Mosaic covenant, they were already obsolete. Okay. Therefore, even in the tabernacle of Moses, they were obsolete. Animal sacrifices were done in the past as a prophetic shadow picture of our Messiah's future death on the cross. However, in the new millennium, they will be conducted as a memorial, as a memorial of what he has done for us in the past. Why do you think in Shemot, in Exodus 12, 14, it says, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial and you shall keep it a feast to Yahuwah throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever, forever. <laughs> I feel like those kids on that, what was that movie uh, about the kids that played baseball? There was like these little boys that played baseball. Little rascals? I forgot. There was a movie where they would go, forever. And they did it in slow motion. I don't know. Never mind. I forgot the name of that movie. <laughs> Usually I would know that. Anyway. Okay, so 
Yahushua commands us to do the Passover in remembrance of him. Are we going to stop remembering him in the millennium? Are we going to stop doing the Passover in the new millennium because we don't need to remember him anymore? Come on. You know, that's not true. How many of you are married and every year on your anniversary, what do you do? You remember. You remember. You have photo albums of your wedding day. You have a video maybe of your wedding day. Do you not go back and remember? Or do you say, well, we're married now. So, you know, we don't need the videotape anymore. We don't need the photo album. Let's just throw this out. We don't need to remember. We don't need to celebrate our anniversary. We, uh, we're married. We know we're married. We don't need to go back and remember anything. That's silly. You see, the, 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 in the new millennium, we are going to continue to remember, to remember, because we are forgetful creatures. And even though many of us will not be in our, our uh, you know, natural bodies, will be in our incorruptible bodies, there will be lots of people who are still in their mortal bodies. And they're going to be learning these things. And Yahushua was going to teach us. He's going to teach us of his ways. By doing the animal sacrifices, we become sorrowful. When you see an animal having to die for our sake, it makes you broken. It gives you a broken and contrite heart. You you look at that animal and you say, that's just, it just breaks your heart. Especially when you take the lamb into your home for four days and you make it your pet. And now you have to kill it. You're going to be broken and contrite. Are you not? Okay. Because when we look at that, we're supposed to remember that's what Yahushua did for us. He died for us. He he took, he was the substitute for the firstborn son. He was the Yom Kippur twin goats. He was the Passover lamb. He was the red heifer. He was all of those things in one fell swoop, okay? Uh, So we know that we are commanded to do these things in remembrance of him, okay? You see, Yahushua's blood was available in eternity to atone for our sins even before he manifested in the flesh and died for us. What does it say in Ibrahim, Hebrews 10, 4? It says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Okay, it never was possible. It never was possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Okay, and this is a very important passage right here. What are you going to say, honey? Oh, uh, Jason in our chat yeah. said that Sandlot is the name of the movie. Sandlot, that's it. <laughs> I knew you would love having the answer. That drives Maria crazy, not knowing. Um, and then he just says, Shabbat is to remember, and the bow in the sky is to remember. That's right. So, continue. Very good. Very good, Jason. Okay, so in Yehuchanan, John 17, 24, this is a Yahushua praying, and he says, Father, I will that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. Then in Ephesians 1, 4, it says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. In Ibrahim or Hebrews 4, 3, it says, for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Ah, so the atoning work of our Messiah was already finished from the foundation of the world. If his atoning work was already finished from the foundation of the world, then why would he need to come here in the flesh and perform these works in front of us? Well, In Hebrews 9.26, it says, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Okay, it's saying that he didn't have to suffer from the foundation of the world. 
But now, once, once in the end of the world, has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. You see, he already did it in eternity, but he came and did it for us, for our benefit, so we could have a visual picture, so we could see it. Okay? First Kepha, First Peter 1.20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Okay? You see, Yahushua's sacrifice was foreordained before the foundation of the world. But in these last times, he manifested himself for us, for our benefit. Revelation 13, 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship the beast, okay, him, and I put in brackets the beast, so we you would understand the context here, whose names were not written in the book of life of the lamb slain, from the foundation of the world. You see, Yahushua has always been that lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Animal sacrifices have always been, always been obsolete. They were obsolete when Yahuwah walked among Adam and Eve in the garden and made animal skins for them. They were already obsolete when Abraham offered up sacrifices, when Jacob offered up sacrifice, all the patriarchs that offered sacrifices, they were already obsolete in the sense that that animal blood never took your sins away, ever, never did, never did. Those animal sacrifices were meant to point us to the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Therefore, in the new millennium, the sacrifices will continue, will continue to put before us, to put before our eyes, to put in remembrance of what he has done for us. Yah forbid that we should ever forget Yahuwah forbid that we should ever forget. Okay? Myth number five. The anti-Messiah will erect a false temple. I hear people say this all the time. They say, oh, when that temple gets built in Jerusalem, that's going to be a false temple. Right? That's what they say. It's going to be a false temple. Here's my response to myth number five. The Apostle Shaul Paul makes it abundantly clear that the anti-Messiah will defile what? The temple of Satan? No, the temple of Elohim. Okay. Second Thessalonians 2, 4 says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim or that is worshiped so that he as Elohim sits in the temple of Elohim showing himself that he is Elohim. Clearly, this is not the temple of Satan. This is actually the temple of Elohim. Now, people are going to say, but wait a minute. If the anti-Mashiach builds it, how can it be the temple of Elohim? You see, it doesn't matter who builds it or whose money is used. What makes the temple holy is the fact that the land is already holy because Yahuwah has chosen to place his name there. Okay, where and when does the Torah command that we kill the Passover? Okay, Debarim, Deuteronomy 16, 2 says, you shall therefore sacrifice the Passover unto Yahuwah, your Elohim of the flock and the herd in the place which Yahuwah shall choose to place his name there. Verse 6, Debarim 16, 6 says, 
but at the place which Yahuwah your Elohim shall choose to place his name in, there you shall sacrifice the Pesach, okay, at evening. Um, okay, and, and here's a whole bunch more passages. First Malachim, First Kings 11.36 says, um, this is about David, and it says, the city which I have chosen to put my name there. Say, it says that David, my servant, may have a light always before me in Yerushalayim, the city where I've chosen to place my name there. Okay. Second Kings 21, four in Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, will I put my name? Second Kings 21, seven in this house and in Yerushalayim, which I have chosen out of all tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. Second Malachim, second Kings 23, 27. And he says, you know, I have removed Israel and will cast off this city, Yerushalayim, which I have chosen and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. Second Chronicles, you know, Debre Hayamim, Second uh, Chronicles six six. But I have chosen Yerushalayim that my name might be there. Okay, Second Chronicles thirty three four. In Yerushalayim shall my name be forever. Second Chronicles thirty three seven. Okay, it says, and he set a carved image, the idol which he made in the house of Elohim, of which Elohim had said to Dawid or David and to Shlomo, Solomon, his son, in this house and in Yerushalayim, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. You see, Yahushua's name, Yahuwah's name is holy. Holy is his name. What makes the temple holy is that Yahuwah has placed his name there. Also, the tabernacle design was given to Moses, Moshe, by Yahuwah. Okay, it's his design. If they build the temple to the specifications that he has laid out in the Torah, Yahuwah will honor it at first. At first, he will honor it until the anti-Messiah goes in and takes away the daily sacrifice. So this notion that the false Messiah is going to build a satanic temple and he's going to defile the temple of Satan, well, then it's not going to be anything egregious. We want him to defile it if it's Satan's temple, don't we? If it's the temple of Satan, then defile away. But no, it's going to be patterned after the design, after the instructions that were given to Moshe. Would that be kind of like defiling vomit? <laughs> I mean, it's already, def it, it's, it's defiled before you defile it. By exactly. definition, it's defiled. Exactly. My mind is boggled completely boggled that there are Torah teachers out there saying that the anti-Messiah building the temple is an abomination. So wait a minute. If heaven and earth hasn't passed away yet, and every jot and tittle of Torah and prophets is still in effect, but you're going to tell me that if they build the temple to the exact specifications, the Temple Institute has the designs they're following the specifications. They might not do it exactly perfectly. They might have a few things wrong, but the attempt, the attempt to raise up the temple is going to be, he's going to honor it for now. For now, he will honor it. Why? Because what he is doing, he's giving the Jewish people a, a second chance. That generation that he was in, he condemned that generation of of uh, Torah leaders, the leadership in his day, he condemned them. But this generation, he's given them a chance to see the shadow pictures of Mashiach 
in the animal sacrifices. He's giving them a chance to see these. Okay. And when the false Messiah comes in and takes away the daily sacrifices and instead sets up an abomination of desolation or the image of the beast. Okay. That's spoken of in Revelation 13, 14. That's when the sin will occur. The building of the temple is not the sin. The the conducting the daily sacrifices are not the sin. Even though these people are not, you know, many of them are Zionists. They're not following Yahuwah. The fact remains that even though the people conducting these things are not his, he will honor it simply because it's his pattern. It's his design. And once you dedicate something to him, it belongs to him whether whether it was perfectly made or not. You can't take it back from him. That's an abomination. Right. So please, people, get this notion out of your head that when they build the temple in Jerusalem and they start doing daily sacrifices, that that's an abomination. What? No, the sin occurs when he takes away the daily sacrifice. That's when the sin occurs. That's when people who have not taken the mark, who will see this and go, oh my goodness, he's taking away the sacrifices. He's the false Messiah. Their eyes are going to be opened. When this happens, they're going to say, oh, he's the false Messiah. He's, he's, he's disobeying Torah. I think some will applaud. No, I know they will. It's, it's so it's so bad, but I mean, I can just see some people who will be, well, thank goodness, because, you know, that was wrong in the first place. They shouldn't have been having blood sacrifices. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I'm saying so there will be Torah people, people who maybe didn't take the mark, that will finally have their eyes open and go, oh, that was the false Messiah. He's, he's disobeying Torah. He's taking away the animal sacrifices. You see that? Why? Yep. Because the animal sacrifice points to Messiah. That's what they're for. They're for worshiping Yahuwah. But like Gary said, oh my goodness, there will be Hebrew roots people. There will be Christians applauding and going, yay, the false, they're, they're going to think he's the real Messiah. Because why? He's taking away the daily sacrifices. And they're going to say, see, Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, so we don't need animal sacrifices. Yay! He's taking away the daily sacrifices. Good for him. You see, they're going to miss it completely. They're going to miss it completely. Because they lump them all together. They don't understand. This is so vital. I can't even emphasize how vital this is. Because there will be people deceived when they see the anti-Mashiach Take away the daily sacrifice. They will applaud, like Gary just said. They're not going to understand. The daily sacrifices are an act of worship. They never took our sins away, ever. The daily sacrifices never took away our sins. They were always meant to point us to the one who was slain from the foundation of the world. They were at their acts of worship. Right up until that point, Yahuwah will honor the animal sacrifices. You know, you can almost think of these sacrifices. I mean, it's clear when we when they make the um, the fragrant offerings on Mm -hmm. the altar, Mm -hmm. it's to represent prayer. right? Right. And when we're in prayer, that means we're in a relationship. And that's a sweet savor to him because he wants our relationship. So that's the whole picture. And so these sacrifices, the morning and the evening sacrifices, that to me that goes right along with it. it it's it's effectively our love for him. Right. It, it's a show of affection. Mm-hmm. It, it, that might seem strange, but it's it's an it's affectionate. We're doing this for him, to him, because we love him. And it's and it's what he requires. Yeah, he's he's instructed it. Our, our obedience is because of affection. That's right. It's not because of fear and trembling, although. He is to be feared, but when you're walking with him properly, a child doesn't fear their father unless they're an abusive father or they're screwing up. Exactly. 
So when the anti-Messiah takes away the daily sacrifice, he is taking away the prophetic picture of Messiah. He is taking worship away from Yahuwah. And he's projecting that worship onto himself by setting up an abominable image, by putting up an abomination. Okay, so when he takes away the daily sacrifices, he is taking worship away from Yahuwah. And he's instead setting up an abomination. Okay, so these Torah teachers that are teaching the exact opposite and saying that the, that the temple itself is going to be an abomination, that the animal sacrifices themselves is going to be an ab abomination, those people are going to lead you astray. They are wicked. The people that are teaching that are wicked. They're going to be in agreement with the false Messiah. They're going to applaud him because he's taking away the daily sacrifice. They're going to applaud the anti-Mashiach. Don't listen to them. Okay. Myth number six, the current Jerusalem, Israel, is a false Israel. I, I hear people say this every day. It grieves the Ruach HaKodesh. It grieves him to hear this kind of thing. The current Jerusalem, the current Israel, they say is false since it was funded by the Zionist bankers such as the Rockefellers and the Rothschild family. Okay, here's my response to myth number six. Despite the fact that the modern state of Israel was financed by the Zionists, Yahuwah allowed Israel to become a nation in 1948 for his own prophetic purposes. Now, I know people that would say, and I hear this all the time, the black Hebrew Israelite group, they'll say, oh, the real Jerusalem somewhere in Africa. Don't listen to that. We are already shown the, the, the borders that were given to Abraham. It extends from the Euphrates River to Egypt. Let's see. It's not in Africa somewhere. I don't know where people get this. Okay. Genesis 15, 18. In the same day that Yahuwah made a covenant with Abram, saying unto your seed, have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the Euphrates. Now, granted, the piece of land that's being occupied right now is much smaller than what it's supposed to be. Okay, we know this. In fact, let me look at a uh, map of promised land. Promised land given to Abraham. Okay, that's really what I want to see. Okay, these small little pictures. But yeah, here's here's an image that I I know I have it somewhere on my computer. I just don't know where it is. So yeah, if you guys can see the red outline, this is the these are the borders. These are the borders of where it's supposed to be. That's what he promised to Abraham. But, you know, they keep giving up more land and more land. It, you know, Israel keeps giving up more land just to just to placate the Palestinians. But I said all of this to say that the part that they're occupying right now is the legitimate land of Israel. Don't believe these lies from these racist people that don't want to believe that that that's the legitimate piece of property. OK, Yahuwah says in Proverbs 13, 22. The wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. If he wants to use the wealth of the Zionists and the Illuminati to finance his prophetic purposes, that's his business. He can do that if he wants. The stage has to be set for the return of the Messiah to the Mount of Olives. See, you'll notice that in Zechariah 12, he didn't say he was going to pour out his spirit on Palestine. No, he said he would pour out his Ruach on Jerusalem in the latter days. And so if it's not legally recognized as the capital city of Israel, then how can he legitimately call that place where he lands his feet Jerusalem? That's why it's important that Donald Trump made Jerusalem the capital city. I believe he's the little horn, even though I believe he is 
a false messiah, what he did was something that had to happen. It had to happen. He's being used by Yahuwah to set the stage, to set the stage. Okay. Zechariah 12, 10 says that he's going to pour out his, the spirit of grace and of supplications upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the kingdom of Judah. Okay. Yahushua has not forgotten national Israel, despite the fact that many of them are still largely in unbelief. He promises to save one third of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the other two thirds will perish. Okay. Zechariah 13, 8 and Ezekiel Five. Let me go to Zechariah 13. Because some people have tried to point out that this is talking about the whole earth. And it is. Because, see, Jerusalem is the center of the earth, right? And right here, when it says, And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, Yahuwah is my Elohim. So right here it says, And it shall come to pass that in all the land, says Yahuwah, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. Well, that phrase, in all the land, right here, is the Hebrew word aretz, which means the earth, right? So yes, it is speaking about the whole earth. But the whole earth is a macrocosm and the, the land of Jerusalem is the microcosm because Jerusalem is the center of the earth. It's the belly button of the earth. It's the womb. It's where it's, you know, Jerusalem is called the mother of us all. Galatians 4.26. Shaul, Paul calls Jerusalem the mother of us all. Okay. And when you read this entire chapter of Zechariah 13, 1, the whole thing is talking about Jerusalem. The whole context of the chapter is Jerusalem. So when he talks about in all the land, he it, it says the earth, but it also means the nation. Okay, it can be interpreted either way. It can be talking about the earth, but it can also be talking about the nation. So... So yes, it's talking about the whole earth, but it's also talking about Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the center of the earth. It's the belly button of the earth, if you will. Okay. The womb, the womb. Okay. So, so I disagree with those people that say the state of Israel isn't the biblical Israel. That's false. Yahushua taught us the parable of the fig tree which gives us an accurate timeline of when he's going to return. In Matthew 24, Metatyahu 24, 32 through 34, it says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So likewise, you, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. And then he says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. How long is the generation? We are shown in Tehillim, Psalm 90, verse 10. It says, the days of our lives are 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. That's the maximum right now. Yet the best of them is but toil and exertion, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Now, by adding 80 years to 1948, it brings us to the year 2028, when I believe our Messiah will return on Yom Kippur. I believe he's coming back on Yom Kippur in 2028. Now, some people would like to cite this passage in Genesis chapter 6, where he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man for, he, for that he also is flesh Yet his days shall be 120 years. Okay, now this word years, shana, can also mean an age. Okay, an age. So some people interpret this to mean 120 jubilees, which is 6,000 years. But you see, he, he put the limit at 120 back in the day. But what happened? Israel 
where filled with doubt and unbelief, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of what? Their unbelief. So what did he do? He removed 40 years from 120 years. And now we're left with 80 years. 80 years is the limit now. When he first wrote this in Genesis, you know, man's days would be 120 years. But because of unbelieving Israel in the wilderness for 40 years, now it's only 80 years. Okay. Okay. Now I'm almost finished. Yeshayahu, Yahu, Isaiah 66, 7. It says, this is referring to Jerusalem. It says, before she travailed, she brought forth, before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. Okay. This is totally a correlation to Revelation 12. Revelation 12 is describing the woman, Jerusalem, who is the mother of us all. Galatians 4.26, Shaul, Paul says, Jerusalem is the mother of us all. She has a crown of 12 stars because she's the capital city of Israel. She gives birth to the man child, which of course in Messiah's day, he was the man child, but the man child is also a corporate man child. It's the one new man. After the two witnesses are killed by the anti-Mashiach, and they resurrect from the dead, they become the one new man. They become the man-child. And who's Revelation 12 talking about? It's Jerusalem. She will be redeemed when she gives birth to the man-child. Okay? Yeshayahu, Isaiah 66, 8, it says, Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day or shall a nation be born at once for as soon as Zion Zion travailed she brought forth her children in verse 9 it says shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth says Yahuwah shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb says your Elohim verse 10 says rejoice you with Yerushalayim and be glad with her, all you that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you that mourn for her. Okay, so don't tell me this is not the legitimate Jerusalem or this is not the legitimate Israel. It is. Think about this. In the days when our Messiah was here, he had lots of rebuke for Israel. He even cursed the fig tree. And when he spoke to that city, and said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stone all the prophets that have been sent unto you. How many times would I have wanted to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chickens, but you would not come to me. Okay. Who, he didn't say fake Jerusalem, fake Jerusalem. Did he call them fake Jerusalem? Because the Romans were in control? Because the, you know, the evil people were controlling Jerusalem at that time. Did he call them fake Jerusalem? No, they were still the legit Jerusalem, even though the Romans were controlling it. So why would it be any different today? Oh, well, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds built the, the modern state of Israel. So what? So what? Yahuwah allows it to humble his people. To bring us to repentance. He uses the heathen nations to humble his people, to bring correction, to bring discipline, to show us when we are living circumspectly before him, when we are living properly before him and obeying him, he allows the enemy to be withdrawn. But whenever we are not living properly, he allows the enemy to oppress us, okay? So just because the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and the Zionists helped to build the modern state of Israel doesn't mean it's not legit, okay? It's, it's, it's utter foolishness to say something like that because as I said, when Messiah was here, Rome controlled Jerusalem. He still called them Israel. He still called them the legit Jerusalem. He didn't say, oh, fake Jerusalem, oh, fake Jerusalem. 
So please, people, stop with the nonsense. There are wolves that have been dispatched into the Hebraic roots community, wolves in sheep's clothing that are teaching false doctrines. And what is it doing? It's messing people's heads up so they cannot see prophecy properly. And they're going to be all out of sorts when the false Messiah sets up the abomination. They're going to applaud when he takes away the daily sacrifice. They're going to applaud when the false Messiah takes worship away from Yahuwah. They're going to think that's a good thing. It's not. Okay, it's not. I'm not saying we should go to Jerusalem and visit the temple. I'm not saying that at all. Yahushua said to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, he says that, you know, the day is coming will you will neither, when you will neither worship in this mountain, Mount Gerizim, or in Jerusalem. He says, but the day is coming when they that worship the Father will worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, we know that's a fact. We don't have to be in Jerusalem because we can worship him no matter where we are because he's in the new Jerusalem, right? And we belong to that city, the new Jerusalem. We belong to that city. But listen, he's got another group of people. He's got two flocks of sheep. He's got those of the house of Ephraim, all the Gentiles in the nations, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But he's also got those of the kingdom of Judah. And he's dealing with them in a different way than he's dealing with us. Those of us who are out in the nations that are born again, we see things more clearly because we've got the Ruach HaKodesh living on the inside of us, but he is still striving with the nation of the, the modern state of Israel. He wants those people to be saved also. Okay. And I've heard people say, oh, he's done with Israel. They, they've rejected him. You know, he's there's no, 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 no. Read Zechariah 12. He is going to pour out his Ruach upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he is going to bring a remnant back to him. So that's it. I'm not going to have time to get into, I know that I said I was going to teach on the other things, but we're going to continue that next week because this is such an important topic. And I see so much misinformation being passed along. Okay. And I, this, we have to set the record straight. We have to. Otherwise, people are going to be lost and deceived. Will animal sacrifices continue in the millennium? We will talk about that next week, part two. Okay. And then we will also probably the following week do what is getting ready to vanish away. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to continue to, to discuss this subject. So you guys can go ahead and, and call in and ask questions. I would love to hear, you, you know, your questions or even just comments. Um, just would love to hear your input. Um, so go ahead and, you know, unmute yourselves. And I'm going to call on people one by one so that people aren't talking over each other. Let me start with Barb. Do you, do you mind unmuting yourself, Barb? And, um, you know, just commenting or asking a question? Yeah. So, um, I was wondering what is the difference between because you had mentioned in the first half, um, you know, the the Levitical priesthood will be reinstituted um, along with the Zadok priests. Mm -hmm. Yep, they were the high priests. How are how is the and then later on you said Levites, son of Aaron and Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. So is our Zadok is the Zadok priest and Melchizedek the same or is that different or what? So, okay. So they were all Levites. Okay. The Zadok priesthood that David um, had in the temple, they were all Levites, but they were from a different family line. Okay. Cause do you remember there was that, that priest named Levi who um, not Levi, I meant to say Eli, <laughs> Eli, the priest where he had, Hophni and Phineas, and they were w wicked priests, and they allowed the 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 uh, you know the Philistines to come in and take the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, they 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 okay. were sinful. So that so that line of priests, uh, they 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 were discontinued as far as their descendants 
taking up the the role of the high priest. So then the the role of the high priest went to this other family called the sons of Zadok. Zadok, but they were Levites too. They just came from a oh, di- okay. a different family. You see what I mean? But but okay. it, but in David's day, in David's time, that was just a prophetic picture. The but the Melchizedek priesthood is going to be those of us that are born again and oh. we are going to be putting on an incorruptible body and we will be his kings and priests. So it won't matter what family bloodline we come from. We're coming from Yahushua's family bloodline, you see? So, okay. cause right here in like in, in Hebrews chapter seven, um, let me see if I can find it. Hebrews chapter seven. It tells us that Melchizedek sprang out of Judah right here. It says, for it is evident that our master sprang out of Yehuda, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. So when you consider the fact that Melchizedek has no mother, it says without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the son of Elohim, abides a priest continually. It means he's eternal. He's always existed in eternity. But he sprang out of Judah, right? He came, he was born into the tribe of Judah. But it, how many of us really c- consider that all 12 tribes were named even before they were born? That Yahuwah knew them mm. before they were born? That in the new Jerusalem in eternity, the, the new Jerusalem already existed? You know, we call it the new Jerusalem because for us it's going to be new, but it always existed. See what I mean? And all the gates are named after the 12 tribes. That's right. This is another good blog that I recommend people read. It's co- it's called Who is Melchizedek? And, oh, okay. and I really recommend this blog because there's so much misinformation taught about Melchizedek. Mm-hmm. Because there are people like in the book of Jasher, supposedly it says that Shem, the son of Noah, was Melchizedek. But oh. I but I identified a scribal error that I think and this is I postulate this and I even talked to Dr. Pigeon about it and he's in agreement with me that this could indeed be a scribal error. Okay. So here's my hypothesis. I believe that because Shem means name, right? When they use the word Hashem, you know, because see the the book of Jasher that we have today is not the same book of Jasher that was originally written. These are all handmade copies. They copied them one by one by hand. They didn't have printing presses where they could make exact copies, right? So if if these were copied by rabbis, they wouldn't use his real name, so they would call him Hashem. So I believe there was a scribal error made where they claimed that Melchizedek was Noah's son Shem, but what they really meant was Hashem, Yahuwah. You see that? But, but, you know, I go into a lot of detail in this explaining that Melchizedek is Yahushua. He is from the order. And people say, well, he's from the order of Melchizedek. Yes, but he's the first in the order. He's the first in the order. We are his royal priesthood that are going to follow after him. He's it's the father and the son. They're both Melchizedek. Well, you know, and I think what I I see from this teaching that um, because I I I felt like I always had the perspective that he that Yeshua cannot be both king and priest Mm -hmm. on the earth. Mm -hmm. And from seeing what you've shared that's incorrect, that he will function like David Mm -hmm. as both king and priest right, on the earth during the millennial reign. That's right. Okay. And then my next question is, (laughs) it's just, you know, I understand the whole thing about the, the resurrected ones, you know, those of us who are we put on the incorruptible, we're resurrected, mm-hmm. um, that we, the, the part that always gets me is this whole thing about, we will teach the nations and we will function as priests and kings among the nations. And I'm like, okay, like, are we just going to get like a, 
supernatural download and know how to do that. Like not all of us are natural teachers. And I think, and I think that somewhat um, comes into or plays into the most and the least in the kingdom kind of thing in Matthew. Um, so how, I, I, I guess I'm just struggling with like, how does that all shake out? And I'm okay with just letting that all shake out the way he wants to shake it out. You know yeah, what I mean? Like right. we will each have our purpose in, mm-hmm. uh, as in, and function, mm-hmm. but how I, I'm kind of all over the place, but do you kind of see where I'm coming from? Like what I'm asking? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think there's going to be training classes. I, you know, I think that, that okay. there's probably going to be training classes. And like you said, there's going to be the least in the kingdom and there's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And, you know, he's going to, judge us but on how we how we manage the riches of this world you know when he ta- taught the parable of the talents those that invested their talents and you know expanded what they had you know he's he's going to trust them with the riches of the kingdom that's why like i you know i i sometimes i feel so much remorse whenever i spend money unwisely because i recognize that the way we're going to be given, uh, you know, we're going to be allotted different cities. You know, he says he, he's going to allot us cities that we're going to get to rule over. We're going to be allotted a leadership position based on how well we manage the riches wow. of this world. So, mm-hmm. you know, I feel so much grief sometimes when I like I spend money unwisely and I'm like, oh, man, this is going to this is going to be a mark against me in the new millennium. <laughs> You know, so, so, but, you know, all we can do is, is try to be wise stewards. And he talks about wise stewards, get, you know, in the parables. So we just try to be wise stewards now because that's going to determine how he, what positions okay. of responsibility we get in the millennium. And that's where the 144, so that- go ahead. That's the whole sowing and reaping principle of what are you sowing? The talent, the gift of the the parable of the talent is, are we sowing into the things of this world or are we sowing our time, talent and treasure into the kingdom, the things of the kingdom? Is that kind of what you're saying? Yes, exactly. And, and also the ones that, that hid their talent, they just buried it. They didn't invest. They didn't invest, Okay, you know? So yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't really know how it's all going to shake out exactly either. Um, mm-hmm. All I can do is go by what's already written, you know. And so I see your husband here. <laughs> I just admitted Warren. Oh, he got on? Yeah. Oh. So, um, but any other questions besides that? I mean, does that, you know, answer? Oh, I have a lot, but. Uh, no, no, go right ahead. Kind of a little bit. No, no, not, not off the top of my head, but. um. Yeah, thank you for the clarification in the very end, because I think that there is going to be a lot of deception. Yes. Um, Yes, I just, I really need to kind of chew on that a little bit more. So, but it totally makes sense. We're going to put it up on YouTube and you'll be able to go back and listen to it. And, and, you know, and like I said, I just wrote this blog called um, Six Common Myths about the yeah. temple I'm sacrifices and abomination. Already. It's kind of like a rough draft because I was up all night working on it. I, and I only got three hours of sleep, but there's a few little things in there I, I need to tweak. But for the most part, all the scriptures are there. And when you read it, you can, you're you like, how do people get this wrong? They think it's the temple of Hasatan. Well, if it's the temple of Hasatan, who cares if it gets defiled then? Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It wouldn't be egregious if it was the temple of Hasatan. It's the temple of Elohim that the false Messiah defiles. <laughs> so the other part, I, I just recently in the last two years of doing Torah, just really began to grasp and understand the offerings that quote sacrifices or offerings that not all of that they're not for atonement. They're for worship and worship. fellowship and mm-hmm. all that type of thing. And, and so do you have any study like on the, because a, one gal in our group kind of broke down all the offerings and mm-hmm. then the purpose and all that kind of thing. Do you have any kind of teaching 
or breakdown of each one of those and what their purpose is? I do to an extent, probably not as detailed as what this woman is did in your group, but I've got one. I cover it in Daniel's 70th week. Um, it's called okay. Who Confirms the Covenant, right? And in this, in this teaching, I show that Yahushua fulfilled all the same sacrifices that were involved in the covenant made with Abraham. That, um, you know, the three-year-old heifer, the three-year-old goat, the she-goat. Oh, the goat of Azazel. Okay, yeah, yeah. you had mentioned that. And, and so, what was the other one? Um, heifer, the uh, Azazel goat, and the... Uh, let me, let me get to this. I'm going to put this in the, okay. um, in the chat. Yeah, the chat okay. so you guys can have it. Yeah, this one is really important. Who confirms the covenant of Daniel 70th week? Um, because a lot of people think it's the false Messiah who confirms it. Right. I, I don't believe that. I believe it's Messiah Yahushua who confirmed the Abrahamic huh. covenant. But it's him who co he uses the anti-Messiah to make the temple desolate, right? He uses him to make them desolate because a judgment, right? Because when he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stone all the prophets that are sent unto you, you know, how many times would I have wanted to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chickens, but you would not. And then he says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Well, it wasn't desolate right away, but I mean, they continued to do the animal sacrifices for 40 more years. And he used those 40 years as a probationary period to get their attention because they saw that the for moving forward after they killed him, the Yom Kippur goat, the red ribbon did not turn white. The red ribbon was oh, supposed yeah. to turn white. And for 40 consecutive years, it didn't turn white. That's not in the Bible, right? That's from Jewish. It's writing. from the Talmud. Yeah, it's from the Jewish Josephus? Talmud, which okay. I, you know, I don't have a problem using the Talmud what, for um, historical historical right. things. It's you know, I don't Commentary. believe mm -hmm. right. We don't use the Talmud as as though it's scripture per se. You know what I'm saying? Um, but in some people go, oh, oh, the Talmud. I'm like, yeah, there's you know, there's there's historical value to the Talmud. I'm not saying I agree with everything in it. But there's some things where, you know, it helps fill in a lot of missing pieces because there's there's history in it. And I'm not saying everything in it is right because it's a commentary of all these different, you know, rabbis. And some were good rabbis and some were bad rabbis. Um, so here's another blog. I call it. It's called Jacob's Time of Trouble and Daniel's 70th Week. And in here, I talk about the 40 year Yom Kippur miracle. Which, which is what hmm. it's called. It's called the 40-year Yom Kippur miracle. And it it proves that Yahuwah was judging them as a nation because they slew their Messiah, okay? Hmm. And it's, it's in here. It's called the Yom Kippur 40-year miracle. And the guy that wrote a book about it, his name was Dr. Ernest L. Martin, and he's dead now, but I copied and pasted his article and give him the credit, you know, for it. So it's talking about the miracle of the lot, you know, when they would cast the lot, um, <clears throat> you know, the red ribbon didn't turn white for those 40 consecutive years, you know, so it's all in here. Having this historical background helps you understand the prophetic purpose of why Yahuwah is going to allow the temple in Jerusalem to be built again. OK, hmm. and there's, there's people that say, oh, those aren't the real Jews that live over there. I'm like, oh, my goodness. When he talks about the synagogue of Satan, he's talking about people like George Soros and Jeffrey Epstein. And those <clears throat> these people are Satanists. They sacrifice mm -hmm. children and they call themselves Jews, but they are not. OK, that doesn't mean that every un unbelieving Jew that lives there. I mean, even the um, what do you call it? The these uh, the Orthodox Jews, they don't believe in Zionism. They're against Zionism. And I I have a a a, a, a video I did about this a couple years ago. Um, they are against Zionism. They recognize Zionism for what it is it, it, that it's evil, and so there's a lot of Orthodox Jews that. <clears throat> 
They might not profess Messiah as of yet, but I think that Yahuwah has a remnant of people that aren't going to take the mark. They're not going to worship the beast and they're going to look upon him whom they've pierced. And, and I believe that I've heard that there are many of them that already believe in Mashiach, but Yahushua as the Mashiach, because there was that Rabbi Kaduri who was oh, right. shown his name was Yahushua. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, not Yeshua, Yahushua. Okay, that's the name that he was shown. And he died, I think, at the age of 100 and something. But he wrote it down. And he said after, um, who was that one prime minister that died? What was his name? Um, can't think of it on the top of my head. That one prime I'm minister. I'm thinking Ariel Sharon. Ariel Sharon, yeah. He was a, he was a uh -huh. president. Yeah, he was. Which, which is different than a prime minister. Okay. But after he died, they opened the letter from that Rabbi Kadori and they in the name that he gave was Yahushua, you know? Um, but so I, I do believe there's a lot of um, Orthodox Jews that are trying to adhere to the Torah to the best of their ability. And sure, they probably, and I've heard through the grapevine that a lot of them already believe in Yahushua, but they don't publicize it for fear of being excommunicated. And some people say, oh yeah, but we're not supposed to be ashamed of him. I agree, we're not. But they're just not there yet. You know what I mean? And and he's he, a bruised reed. He will not snuff out. You know what I'm saying? He's he's giving them a chance. And and I, I believe that the building the temple is going to be for the purpose of showing them a prophetic picture of Messiah uh, as the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. And, you know, it's the the sin is going to be when he takes away the anti messiah takes away the daily sacrifices. He's going to be taking worship away from Yahuwah. So these Torah teachers that are saying that's going to be a good thing when they take away the daily sacrifice, they are teaching false. What they're teaching is well, and I think that's even prevalent in the Christian church too. Yes, um, without a doubt. Um, yeah. I think what's happened is that a lot of us came out of the Christian church. We got into Hebrew roots and some people started to go veer off a little bit too far into Judaism and starting <laughs> to like accept some of the rabbinical things. But now they're overcorrecting. And what they're doing mm. is they're going back to the replacement theology ideas again. And it's like you never even left the Christian wow. church. They're adopting this replacement theology mentality, you know, and it's like the dispensationalism. Yeah. yeah. That's why Yahushua says, Lean, look not to the left, neither to the right. It's so important yeah. to be balanced, right? Well, and it's getting harder and harder to, you know, weed through because I listen to different teachers, but I see it too. I'm like, oh my gosh, like he's gone off the rails here and then they go off the rails here. It's just like, you know, that narrow way is what I'm looking for and to. And you're right. I think a lot of people are just drifting off into in, in both camps. And I don't know about you, but, you know, you can say if this rings true to you, Barb. You know, we don't broadly watch a lot of other people. We're busy, you know, doing what you who has got us doing and, you know, our own ministry and podcasts. So we don't watch a lot of other people people mm -hmm. but we still see enough shared through other people on facebook and on youtube and whatnot that we see other people who are kind of going off in these different areas and it seems like mm -hmm. everyone gets caught up in their own pet project instead of being open-minded and continuing to look at what they've taught is this still correct is this still does this still appear to yeah. be the case and making adjustments People tend to dig their heels in and they just, you know, whether it's flat earth, whether it's, you know, the Jews in Israel are not the real Jews, the Ashkenazis, you know, all this stuff. They just don't keep an open mind. We can all get fooled once in a while, but then there should be correction, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, in this whole idea about the Ashkenazis and the Khazars, look, it, it doesn't really matter whether, the, I mean, script, we, I did some research in this. They are not of descended from Ashkenaz. They were sent there into exile. Okay. Right. Part of the Silk Road. 
Right. And it says right here in Jeremiah 115, for lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north. Okay. That's like Russia, Poland, you know, Germany says Yahua, and they shall come and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Yerushalayim and against all the walls thereof round about and against all the cities of Yehuda. So he said he would, he says in those days, Jeremiah 3, 18, the house of Yehuda shall walk with the house of Israel and they shall come together out of the mm. land of the north. So be careful when we say, oh, those Khazars, those, you don't, look, just because you hear somebody say something like through the grapevine, I, I hear a lot of people regurgitating what they're hearing from some of these false teachers. And I they, agree. They're just regurgitating. And I'm like, did you look into it yourself? Did you do a DNA mm -hmm. test out on every single person that lives in Israel today? Like, who are you to say they're not of who they are? You don't know who they are. Yahuwah knows who they are. You know, Jeremiah 10, 22, behold, the noise of the brute is come and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Yehuda desolate and a den of dragons. OK, so, yeah, that's going to happen. But he did say that he was that he would call them out of the land of the north and he would, he says, to the land that I have given them for an inheritance. And he's specifying the house of Judah. So be careful when we call them false Jews because, uh -huh. because we're slandering and we don't know who's who. Leave that up to the father. He knows who's who, right? Exactly. And I, I just get very grieved when I hear, oh, the synagogue of Satan. He's talking about the Jeffrey Epsteins of the world, the, 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 the satanic right. people that do child sacrifices. And he's not talking about your average Israeli citizen that lives over there and they're trying to do the best they know how with what limited knowledge and understanding that they have. You know, it says he's going to seal them in the foreheads ahead of time. It says this right in Revelation 7. You know, it says he's going to, you know, it, it says right here, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our Elohim in their foreheads. And then he numbers the tribes. He numbers them. And, and I believe there's two groups of 144,000. The group in hmm. Revelation 7 I believe are the ones that haven't accepted Yahushua yet, but they came from the land of the North, which is Russia, Poland, Germany, you know, 1948, there was a mass exodus, the greater exodus that everyone talks about. It started in 1948. I don't see this hmm. big, you know, greater exodus where all the oceans of the world split and everybody walks across dry land. I don't see right. that. I don't, everybody, you know, when it, they ask me if I believe in the greater exodus, yes, I do. But it's not the way some people are teaching it. I believe the greater mm -hmm. exodus, it started in 1948. And so, you know, he's put a seal on their foreheads because he knows which ones are going to accept him when he comes back. Right. And then in Revelation 14, it's totally different characteristics. These people follow the lamb wherever he goes. They have their father's name in their foreheads. They are not defiled by the mother harlot system. They follow the lamb wherever he goes, you know. So, so I believe that the ones in Revelation 7 are the ones that came out of the land of the north in 1948. They began coming back to the land and Yahuwah puts a, a seal on them and preserves preserves them for the day when, you know, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. A bunch of them are going to come to the Mount of Olives to meet their Messiah. So the other ones in Revelation 14 are the ones like us who are the believers. That's right. Exactly. Okay. Yep. That we do believe. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Because when you were, when you look at Revelation seven, right after he seals them, it says, and after this, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Okay. So this is 
um, the multitude. The multitude is Ephraim, because remember what Jacob, Jacob prophesied over his grandsons, Joseph's two, two little sons. And what did he say in, in, in Genesis 4, 17? He says, um, you know, and, and when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, not so, my father, for this is the first born. Put your right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. So Ephraim are the 10 lost tribes that went were scattered into the mm-hmm. nations and they're the born again people. That's who the 144,000 are in Revelation 14. They're the multitudes that are Israel by by proxy. They, you know, they're the, they're part of the commonwealth of Israel. And and the name Ephraim means double fruit because he's because we're doubly fruitful because we've been we've received the gospel and we've been, you know, publishing the gospel. But Manasseh, his name means to cause to forget, because after the Roman siege, the house of Judah was pretty much forgotten for a long time. But Yahuwah still has a plan for the kingdom of Judah. That's why in 1948, their exile, their punishment was finished and he brought them back to their own land so that they could begin to see prophecy unfold. And all the nations are blessed by, by Israel becoming a nation again. How many of us would be Hebrew roots today if Israel had not become a nation in 1948? Right. We wouldn't be. Is the completion of the greater exodus when the two houses come together, the, the two sticks in Ezekiel? Exactly. Is that what that is? That's what, okay. I, that's what I see. Okay. Because when you look in Ezekiel, it first, it ta- in Ezekiel 37, it talks about the... um cut the bones, the valley of the dry bones coming Mm -hmm. out of their graves, right? And he says, oh, you dry bones, hear the word of Yahuwah. Thus says Yahuwah unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live and I will lay sinews upon you and will bring, bring upon, bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am Yahuwah. And so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a shaking and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, say to the wind, thus says Yahuwah Elohim, come from the four winds, O breath. And breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet. An exceeding great army. This is the army that's coming back with Messiah on white horses. We're going to be coming back with him. Well, where's the bride been that she's now coming back with him? And that's another one. People keep saying there's no rapture. Please. We know it's not pre-trib. The Christian church is wrong about the pre-trib. It's post-trib. But now they're overcorrecting and saying there's no rapture at all. And I'm like, they're mm. they're just, they're missing it. Look, yes, there is a harpazo. The bride's going to be caught up to heaven. We're going in the hupa. He says, in my father's house, there are many mansions and ancient Hebrew customs. The bridegroom got, they got engaged. They signed the ketubah. The bridegroom goes away and prepares a honeymoon suite on his father's estate for his bride. And then he comes back for her in the, at a future time. And what do they do? They elope. Every eye's not going to see him. He's going to snatch her away at that time in the middle of the night. That's when he comes for the bride at midnight when everybody's asleep. And people say, oh, it's not, there's no secret rapture. 
What do you mean? Paul said, behold, I tell you a mystery. That word in Greek, mystery, is mysterion. It means a secret. It is a secret. He, they, they, they elope and go into the hoopa, into that private set apart place. Mm. And then we come back. Then he comes back with his bride and we're all, we're his army and we're going to fight with him. And, and he, and he says, he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Okay. And that's when he goes and he talks about the two sticks right here. Right here, he talks about the two sticks. We're going to become one stick after we're resurrected. The one new man, mm. the man child, the woman gives birth to who? The man child. Who's the woman? Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the mother of us all, Paul said in, in Galatians 4.26. So the woman is redeemed when she gives birth to the one new man, just like Tamar was redeemed when she bore twins to Judah. Okay, Jerusalem, when she gives birth to the twins, the two witnesses, the twins, just like Tamar, that's when she's redeemed and she gets her land back. Okay, so Tamar could not inherit, receive her inheritance until she gave birth to twins by Judah. And it's the same thing. The woman is Jerusalem. When she gives birth to the one new man, that's the two witnesses and their resurrected bodies, the man child. But so many people miss that and they say there's no rapture and they say, oh, every eye shall see him. That's true. But but we can't confuse the second coming with the secret rapture. There oh. is a secret rapture and people go, oh, that's a Christian doctrine. No, it's not. It's a Bible doctrine. The Christians are right on that one. They're just wrong about the timing. They think it's pre-trib. It's not. So the Christians aren't wrong about everything. And the secret is the day and the time. Yes. And even it shouldn't be the day, really, except that we don't know, you know. The day that no to, man knows. We have to watch for the sliver, but it's an yeah. idiom. But, I mean, it just depends where, like everything, you have to define the terms. It's not a secret that it's going to happen. So no, there's not a secret from that perspective. If you properly look at scripture, it's going to happen. It's not a secret. But if you mean it's a secret because of the time, you know, then, okay, yeah, it's a secret. It's it's done covertly. Yes. You know. it, why would he come at midnight when everybody's asleep? You know? I guess what I feel more comfortable with, and maybe it's having come, come out of dispensational teaching, is the word, using the word resurrection. Mm -hmm. Rather than rapture, I just I get you know it, but I mean? here's the like, difference. I think that's there, more biblical. There will be people that are martyred um, in after the, during the ten days of all after the quote unquote okay. rapture, and they'll still be resurrected. They just won't be in their incorruptible bodies. So there is a distinction between getting a resurrected body and being resurrected. Because remember, when he resurrected Lazarus. Lazarus lived out the rest of his life and then died. He did. He wasn't. He didn't put on incorruption. So okay, it's not enough to just call it the resurrection, because other people in the past have been resurrected and they didn't get incorruptible bodies. The the okay. So you're saying there is a distinction then with the rapture versus just a resurrection. Exactly. Now I call it the harpazo because that is the biblical okay. word. It's called the harpazo. The catching away is called the harpazo, the two witnesses. That's when it says that they are they are caught up to heaven and to the throne. And the word that's used there is harpazo. You know, and and it's like I don't know how people miss this, but here it is right here. It's it says that her child, she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations. Well, we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And her mm -hmm. child was caught up. There it is. Harpazo to seize, to catch away, to take by force, to pluck. It's the same word that's used in first Thessalonians right here. First Thessalonians 4, 17, where it says, 
then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Yahuwah in the air, and so shall we ever be with Yahuwah. That doesn't mean we're going to go to heaven forever from that point on. We're just going to be with him as in we're married to him, right? But we're we're only going to be gone for those 10 days that Smyrna has to go and suffer tribulation for 10 days. And during those 10 days, the bride's going to be in heaven, consummated with consummating with the bridegroom in the chuppah. I mean, it's even talking, it talks about that in Psalms 19. It's it talks about the bridegroom coming out of his hoopa, you know, right here, Psalms 19. It says that their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world in them. He has set a tabernacle for the son. OK, the, the, the son of righteousness, Yahushua is called the son of righteousness. He comes with healing in his wings. The son is a symbol of Messiah. He's the light of the world. But. Satan tries to counterfeit that with pagan sun god worship. And so he wants us to think that he's the sun. But Yahushua is the prophetic picture of the sun. Okay. And it says, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And that word is hupa. There it is. A wedding hupa. <laughs> and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. So he's coming out of his chamber and he's excited because he's just consummated with his bride. And now he's coming back with her in Revelation 19 and she's his army. Okay. So those are the the ones that are gathered or caught away. Yeah. They we <laughs> are the ones that are have the we put on immortal, like in the twinkling of an eye, we're transformed, all that, right? Right, right. But you're saying the ones that are left during the 10 days of us, Myrna, yeah, that and then they will see the one whom they have pierced. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they will be resurrected but not put on immortal immortality. Well, it says right here, okay, he says to them. And here's why I know, I believe Smyrna are probably like Jews that are keeping Torah, but they don't know his name yet. Okay. The, re the reason okay. I think that is because this name Smyrna means strengthened for myrrh. Well, who else was strengthened for myrrh before she went to meet her king? Esther. Esther was, right? She, she prepared herself with myrrh. And myrrh is known to be a purifying agent. And it's they used it to anoint dead bodies, right? And what does he say to them? He says, um, fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation 10 days. Be you faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. So they will be hmm. killed after the harpazo after the rapture or the harpazo, but I believe that they will be resurrected. I'm not sure they will put on in corruption though, because that would hmm. mean that there'd be two raptures or two harpazos. And we know there's only one there's the resurrection. Okay. You know what I mean? So I don't know how that's because like right here, it talks about. Hmm. Yeah. Because the second resurrection, there's a first and second resurrection, right? Right. Okay. Okay. So you're making a distinction. Okay. This makes more sense. But here's the thing. Okay. There's only, there's only the first resurrection um, on such the second death has no power and they shall be priests of Elohim and of Messiah and shall reign a thousand years. And then the other resurrection is for the wicked when the thousand years mm -hmm. are finished. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yep. they are brought up from their graves and Grave. they and they are mm -hmm. judged out of the books now some people will say well there's only two you're right there's only two resurrections but you know elijah the prophet raised that little boy from the dead um yahushua raised lazarus and jairus's daughter from the dead so when we and we include those other resurrections it seems like there's a lot more resurrections but i contend that when messiah said to um martha he says, I am the resurrection, right? And the life. 
So there really is only one resurrection. It's just that in eternity, all these people who have resurrected in the past, it's one event in eternity. Does that make sense? Okay. I can wrap my brain around that. I mean, if if I can say it in a different way, and too, um, to go along with that, um, you know, there are many that were resurrected at the time that Messiah resurrected, right? Right. right. Five, mm-hmm. Yeah. But they didn't have their... Incorruptible. Incorruptible bodies. Right. So okay. there's only one resurrection that we become incorruptible, right? Mm-hmm. That that's that's an event. So Mashiach was the first of yes. the grave. And when they say that, they they're intending you to understand mm-hmm. that that's he's the first of incorruptibility. Like first the first fruit. like like the first fruits, exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's not to say that okay, when so he's the first fruits of that type they, of they resurrection. Say the first Okay. Oh my gosh. This is new to me. Right. Okay. So like Maria said, there's, there's other times when people have resurrected to be human again, and then they've died at the end of their life, mm-hmm. maybe right. five years, maybe 20 years, but they, it was a, it was a one-off, right? It was a specific instance, right. but it's not part of, like quote, a healing. yeah, but it's not quote unquote, the resurrection. Immortality. Okay. Right. So that's only going to happen once. And so when we say the resurrection, that can mean anybody's resurrection, even from the past. And that's why I want to emphasize the word harpazo because there, it's different mm. in the sense that we are changed into incorruption. And so my guess is, and, you know, I'm not saying I'm 100% sure of this, but so far this is what I can see is I think Smyrna are those that don't know his name yet. They don't have the oil of his name because all he says to them is he commends them because they have good works and he compares them to the synagogue of Satan and says, you know, I I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the, the blasphemy of them, which say they are Yahudim, but are not and are of the synagogue mm. of Satan. So he's saying, you guys are the real thing. You guys are the real deal. And I know the ones that aren't really Jews, but you guys are the real deal. Right. And I mean, he's not saying that, but that's what I'm that's what I'm getting from this, right? That he's, the reason he's comparing them to Jews is because he's saying, you're the real thing. But the only thing they don't have is they don't have the oil of his name. That's why they have to suffer tribulation for 10 days. Because I always wondered, why do they have to suffer tribulation for 10 more days? And then I realized there's a correlation between Smyrna and the foolish virgins. Okay, the foolish virgins are still virgins. They're still undefiled by the mother harlot system. They are still numbered by the number five, which is the five books of Moses. They're keeping Torah. They are undefiled by the mother harlot. But what's missing? They don't know his name. That's the only Hmm. thing that they're missing. And that can be ignorance or deception. I mean, there's been so many lies about Mashiach, whether it's Jews telling a story that misrepresents who Yeshua really was, or whether it's um, Christians uh, presenting things that they know don't line up with Scripture, so they they uh, they toss him out without giving him a fair look. Right. Mm-hmm. Either way, they 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 have a lot of it, but they're just missing the oil of his name, if you will. In Philadelphia, I correlate to the wise wise virgins because they have the open door hmm. that no man can shut, and they get to go on the Feast of Trumpets. And Mm -hmm. what he says to them is he says, you have kept my word. You know, that's obedience to the Torah. And he says that, that you've not denied my name. So they have the double portion. Not only are they Torah observant, but they also know him by name, which means Mm. they are intimate with him. They know him. Where Smyrna, he says, yes, you've got good works, but he doesn't commend them for knowing his name. So Hmm. as I put all this together, I realized, oh, Smyrna must be talking about the ones that are Jews that are obeying Torah. They don't take the mark of the beast. They're not worshiping the beast. You know, they're they're undefiled by the Muller harlot system. But the only thing they don't know is they call him Hashem. They call him Adonai. They don't know him by name, you know, and that's what they're missing. And why does he say they have to suffer 10 days? Well, there's 10 days between the Feast of Trumpets and Yom Kippur. 
So I realized, okay, there's two separate events. There's the harpazo for the bride on the Feast of Trumpets. Ten days later, he comes back with mm. his bride on white horses. On Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur. <laughs> okay. So. That you, makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it. I he started showing this to me in 2002 when I started seeing the two different hundred groups of 144,000. And, you know, it's not a literal 144,000. It's 144,000 right. leaders because the way Israel was numbered was according to their heads of yeah. household. So Right, like in the book of Numbers. Right, exactly. So, okay. And in the Gospels, the loaves and the fishes, when he fed the multitudes, it says that that 5,000 did not even include the women and the children. So... Um, you know, th that had to have been an even bigger number than we even suppose. It was probably like 20,000 people, you know. Um, so there's a precedent already established in scripture about how they're numbered as according to their heads of households, you know. So it's 144,000 clans or, or 144,000 families probably, which is which is probably a much bigger number. Because when you consider Jacob had 70 souls that went to Egypt with him, that 70 people were part of his clan. And, you know, so they might they might have much bigger families than, you know, what American people have, two kids, and that's pretty much it, you know. Um, so who can, you know, we don't know how big that number is, but to, it never says 144,000 individuals. So, you know what I mean? It's. I believe it's 144,000 mm -hmm. heads of households and families, you know. But I believe the larger number is the one in Revelation 14. They represent Ephraim, who's the multitude of nations. Whereas the smaller group is the ones in Revelation 7. They represent Manasseh. Manasseh, whose name means to cause to forget, they represent the, you know, the nation of the modern state of Israel. And I believe that their exodus began in 1948, and it's still in progress. I think it's still in progress that the, the, the greater exodus is probably going to continue right up until the second coming. Um, but, you know, I, and, you know, when people mention this greater exodus, I believe that that's we're going to be gathered from the four winds and caught up to heaven. That's another aspect of the greater exodus we're exiting out of this world to be given our citizenship in the new jerusalem and our new body you know but then we're coming back to rule with him so i hope that all makes sense okay. <laughs> it does thank you you're welcome i'm i know uh other people probably have some questions jason do you have any questions brother i don't have any you don't i don't have any i'm pretty pretty on board with what you're saying there um so yeah good teaching thank you you're welcome how about you brother warren <laughs> comments or questions brother hello no i'm just listening in okay thank you you're welcome <laughs> well so next week okay i you know i was hoping i would have time for to cover these other blogs but you know, I, this one that I just wrote last night, Six Common Myths About the Temple, the Sacrifices, and the Abomination. This is the one I covered today. Um, we'll probably make this into a series where next week we'll go over this one called Will Animal Sacrifices Continue in the Millennium? And then the following week, What is Getting Ready to Vanish Away? Because, you know, it talks about that in um, Hebrews about, you know, the, the, the old Levitical system is ready to vanish away, but it hasn't vanished away yet. It will vanish away after the millennium. I mean, the Levites will still exist. It's just that they're going to be absorbed into the Melchizedek priesthood because at the end of the millennium, uh, in Revelation 21, it says the new heaven and the new earth will come down and the bride will be adorned for her husband. 
And we will become the new Jerusalem. We will be the living stones that make up the new Jerusalem. So I believe everybody that lived in their natural bodies throughout the millennium, uh, if they don't get deceived when Hasatan is released out of the bottomless pit, if they pass that test, then they will put on incorruption at this point. The new Jerusalem will be part of the new Jerusalem. So the, the Levites, they'll still exist. It's just they'll be absorbed into the Melchizedek priesthood, which is a, an eternal priesthood, if that makes sense. Arnona said that she's uh, glad that you covered this. She's been trying to show the same thing about animal sacrifices continuing in the millennium. Mm -hmm. uh, but she does say no, no questions. Okay, good. Well, if you write up here... There is the um, blog link. I, I named originally I named it five common myths, but then I thought of another one. So now I changed the name to six common myths. Um, so but the, the URL still shows the name as being five. Yeah, exactly. Jason has his hand up. Oh, yeah. Hey, hey Jason. What, go ahead. No, I just uh, wanted to mention if, if, you know, most people don't believe that and um, I came to that revelation just reading the book of Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when you mentioned um, how Ezekiel was to prophesy over the bones, um, I don't know if you mentioned if that was the resurrection. To me, I took it as that. And I started lining it up with the book of Revelation. And it, just, it just seems like... Um, it just, I mean, it, it straight up tells you in the book of Ezekiel that there, there's going to be sacrifices again. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, you know, what I, what I try to do is just kind of refer people to read Ezekiel, you know, in this context. And you, I mean, it's right there. I do the it's same right thing. There. But, you know, the people that promote this idea that there's not going to be animal sacrifices in the millennium, they say that Ezekiel's temple was conditional only if Israel repented as a nation, but because they didn't, now Ezekiel's temple's not going to happen. And I'm like, what? Uh, it, I mean, uh, the stuff that they say is so ridiculous. It's like, why would he put it in there? Why would Yahuwah put it in there? If, 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 like, let me dangle this in front of their face and say, this is what you could have had, but too bad you can't have it now. Like, that's not his, that's not his way. That's not our that's not our our creator's way. He knows all things before they happen. There's nothing in scripture that's there by happenstance, right? The only thing that's you can remotely look at and say, well, this is this is a like the pattern, but I would disagree. Mm -hmm. Is in Deuteronomy at the end when basically um you know, we're hearing that, you know, if you if you follow my ways, this will be for, this will be for you. Right. Right. So he says if. Because mm -hmm. he knows they won't ultimately they won't continue. Mm -hmm. He knows they will begin, mm -hmm. you know, in, in obedience, but they will not continue. So he says, if you follow my ways, these are the blessings that will happen upon you. Mm -hmm. But when you don't. When you don't, not if you don't, when you don't. These are the things that will befall you. So, you know, he's not saying, you know, I'm going to do this or I'm going to hold this or maybe or I'm not sure. Yahuwah knows the heart of man. Mm -hmm. He knew that they would try for a while, but ultimately they would fail in walking out his Torah and these things would befall them. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about, this, you know, Ezekiel's temple being conditional is just, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I'm not the one saying that, but right. I know, yeah. No, there, exactly. But there are people that are saying that. I'm like... Yeah. So, Jason, do you have another question? No, I just wanted to mention, too, just uh, kind of reaffirm what you're saying with the sacrifices. Um, I mean, they, there wasn't only sacrifices for sin, but there was burnt offerings. There yes. were mm -hmm. grain offerings. There were peace offerings. Yep. Um, and, you know, and all this like, just constitutes like um, covenant and um, yes. fellowship with God and with our brethren. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know why everybody's so fixated that it was just like all for sin. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, 
I mean, these are like Torah teachers, people that are supposed to know better, people that, you know, have PhDs next to their names and everything. And they're and they're saying this kind of stuff. I'm like, how do you guys not know this? You know, like, I'm just floored. I'm just floored, you know, and, and, and it might not seem that like important of a thing because people say, oh, well, you know, it's not a salvation issue, but it could lead to deception because if people believe there won't be animal sacrifices when the false Messiah shows up in the temple and he takes away the daily sacrifice, they'll be applauding him and going, oh, good, good, good. He's taking away the daily sacrifices. See, that's an abomination because people think this, the animal sacrifices are an abomination. I'm like. They're an abomination, you know, because Christians, especially, and even Torah people, Hebrew roots people, I'm just, I'm just shocked that they're adopting this Christian mentality that all all animal sacrifices are, you know, equate to blood atonement for sin, and, and so I, it's crazy. But <laughs> and plus, the priests are going to have to eat. You know, one of the things I like to say to people is if a bunch of Christian pastors went deer hunting and they shot a big buck and they, you know, skinned it and, you know, prepared it and put it on a, you know, a big fire, open fire pit. They roasted the venison and then they all sat around and ate venison and they prayed together. Would that be a sin? And you ask any average Christian, no, no, it's not a sin. Well, why not? Uh, well, because, you know, I mean, we're allowed to eat, right? And I'm like, exactly. That's what the priests are going to be doing. They're going to they're gonna eat, you know, but beef barbecue, lamb barbecue. We're going to get to have beef and lamb barbecue with him if we're our kings and priests. If we're his kings and priests, we're going to get to eat barbecue with him in the temple. Hopefully. <laughs> He'll probably put me in charge of the of roasting the lamb. I'm just kidding. <laughs> because I, I I like to uh marinate my lamb in garlic and spices and anyway, just being funny. Jason's got his hand up again. Go ahead, Go ahead Jason. Well yeah, I mean man, immediately when you said that, that kind of rests my brain about the sacrifices. I immediately started thinking about like uh, Abel and the sacrifice he gave. Right. You know. Is that an abomination? You know, like... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and it says that his, you know, God um, uh, saw his, his sacrifice or, or honored it. And mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, this is before temple worship. This is before all that. And, exactly. And saying, we're seeing this right here. Like, exactly. Yeah, I know there's a lot of people that are buying into that whole vegan mentality and they're like, like, you know, when one lady on Facebook, she saw the title of my message today and she she left a comment, leave the animals alone, you know, and I'm like, oh, gosh, it's like so many tour people are becoming like these PETA people, these, P, you know, what does PETA stand for? I forget. People for the ethical treatment of animals. Yeah. Oh, I just pulled that out of my head. <laughs> I usually can't do that. Yeah, and it's like, gosh, this sounds like, you know, like in First Timothy where, um, I think it says, or First Timothy chapter 4 where, you know, Shaul says, you know, in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, you know, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, you know. And that's what's happening right now. They're getting ready to make it impossible for us to have meat, you know, making the price of meat go so sky high. They're, they're going to try to create meat in a lab, you know. And they're making it part of the whole green deal. Raising animals, livestock is destructive to the environment. So we've all got to do our part in saving the planet by not eating meat. And this word meat is broma. It's this Greek word broma. And it means especially ceremonial articles allowed or forbidden by the Jewish law. OK, now, of course, Strong, Strong's Concordance, he, you know, he uses the term Jewish law. But we know that means he's talking about the Torah. Right. So meats. This is talking about animal sacrifices and eating of meat. So. We are seeing these doctrines of devils played out in front of us. They're going to start making it, 
you know, people forbidding people to get married. Uh, the only way they'll be able to get married is they'll have to get married by the court, the United Nations court, you know, um, and, you know, forbidding the eating of meat. So, yeah, this is uh, this is bad, you know, but people in even the Torah community have this mentality like, oh, leave the animals alone. Like the animals are here for our benefit. <laughs> they don't have an eternal existence, but there's people that actually think animals, their pets will live forever. No, there'll be animals in heaven, but they just won't be the same animals we had as pets. You know, when they die, that's it. And I told one lady that she calls herself a prophetess and she's a Christian lady. She's like, she got really upset. She goes, oh no, I know my animals are going to live forever. I'm like, then there's no difference between animals and humans. According to you, then that means that, you know, we weren't created in his image or animals were created in his image also. No, only humans were created in his image. So don't, you know, I hate when people put human um, animals on the same level with humans, you know, it's like we are distinct from animals, you know, anybody else have questions or comments? No. Okay. Thank you so much guys for joining us. We enjoyed having you. You, I, what I'll do is in the link to the YouTube video, I'll put the link to the, vi to the, um, to the blog so that you guys can follow along with the blog that I just wrote, um, six common myths. So I'll put this link in there and you'll, and the link to the other ones too. So you guys can access the blog from the YouTube video. Okay. Um, cool. yeah, okay. the impossible burger. Exactly. <laughs> Solvent green. Exactly. Um, Yes, you're right. It It is a reference to Catholic priests and nuns, too. But you see, the one world Catholic religion is trying to take over the world. So, yeah, I agree with you. And I've said that for years, that the forbidding to marry is, you know, the Catholic priests and nuns. But they're going to try to make that a universal thing for everybody. Yep. Go ahead, Jason. I wasn't sure if... Uh... You were saying that you guys were going to have another fellowship next uh, Shabbat? Yes, we do. We are going to. I think we're going to start doing it at noon because I find that okay. more people are available if we wait a little longer in the day. Whereas we do it earlier in the day because we're on the West Coast. Some people um, can't make it because they got another fellowship that they attend or, you know, like Saturdays, maybe they like to sleep in a little bit. So I know yeah. I do. Yeah, I, I do too. Because sometimes I'm up all night working on my teaching. Like this morning, I didn't climb in bed till 7 o'clock. No, it was later than that. It was 8.30. Yeah, I climbed in bed at 8.30 this morning. So I only got three hours of sleep. But I was working on this Six Common Myths blog all night long. But, um, so. Cool. Yeah, thank you guys. Honey, you want to close us out with a prayer? And we will. Uh, sure. Father, I just pray that you would um, be with us all as we go about our our lives this week, Father. Um, you would give us the strength to make it through, that things are crazy, that you would give us sort of an emotional peace, Father, that we wouldn't be, you know, fretting too much about the craziness going on around us. Help us to um, have your word on the tip of our tongue, Father, that we'd be ready to share with others. And you who I just ask that you would give us an anointing. That uh, when we share your word, Father, it would be, you know, magnified. It would be not us speaking, but that it'd be you speaking through us. Um, that uh, our testimony would be right there, waiting, you know, for the person to ask. And um, we ask that you just make provisions for us for the situations that are coming our way. That we would be a safe haven for others. You just help us to prepare in whatever way uh, you want us to. Um, that we'd hear your voice, that when you move, we would move. When you say stay, we would stay. And that we would be in peace and we would not be agitated and fretting as many are and as is so easy to do at these times, Father. We just ask your blessings upon our people worldwide that you would deliver them from the evil 
of these mandates. Yes, Father. Of these face covering and poking and lockdowns, Father. We just ask you to deliver and make a way for your people. In Yahushua Hamashiach's name. Amen. All right, guys. Oh, one more thing. I don't know if you guys saw this, but on my Facebook wall, um, I'm gonna, un, you know, I'm going to make it available. But I, I, I have it right now on private settings, so only I can see it. But um, this was last night. I didn't even see this, but uh, let me see if I can. Uh, I'm making it public now. So last night. They had on Trinity Broadcasting Network, right, Um, this whole, like, documentary about the Abraham Accords. So is it basically a blessing or making it look like it's a positive thing, this this three-church monstrosity happening in, what is it, in Dubai? Well, okay, so there's the One World Religion, which is, you know, Pope Francis is spearheading that, but the One World... um, government is being spearheaded by Trump. I mean, he's the one that's his brainchild. You know, his brainchild is the Abraham Accords. But you know what I think is really interesting? Take a look at this graphic. You have the Israeli flag right next to Trump, right? And you got the American flag behind Netanyahu. Why is that? I think they're telling us something because remember, Trump actually made a tongue in cheek, you know, everybody thought it was a tongue in cheek remark. Um, He said that someday he might be the prime minister of Israel. Uh, I forget, I'm looking for the quote, the exact quote, okay? Where is it? I can't find it, but he did say, he jokes, here it is. Trump jokingly told Jewish donors that he could one day be Israel's prime minister. And he said that November 2019, exactly two years ago. Now, why would he say something like that? You know, there's nothing by accident in politics. When they make these kind of tongue-in-cheek remarks, there's something to it. There is. So I just think that the I, I just think this is funny that Trump is standing next to the Israeli flag. And Netanyahu is standing next to the American flag. Oh, it's probably just a coincidence. (laughs) (laughs) That's the kind of thing I would say a long time ago. (laughs) And I realize there's no such thing. Everything is carefully staged. (laughs) Exactly. Especially when it's a graphic like this, right? Yeah, exactly. Why would they do that? It could be a real picture. Even when they do like events and they have stages and they have people come up. It's carefully, painstakingly thought out. Yes, exactly. They don't just stick up flags and some podiums up there and it's like, okay, we got, you know, four podiums and four guest speakers. No, no. Yeah. They have the distance of the flags, the type of flag, the type of podium, the symbols on the podium. Yeah, exactly. Everything. The order that the people go in. Yeah. It's all postulated about. Yep. For the best effect to mm-hmm. push their narrative. One more thing. So Jason mentioned, what is this metaverse stuff? Be really careful what you see and filter that. So I don't remember of which company it is, but Facebook some years ago, I think they bought the company that makes the Oculus Rift, which is virtual reality goggles. That was like, what, five years ago, maybe, or something like that? Well, they've been continuing to develop it. And now the metaverse, I think, is going to be Facebook 2.0 or 3.0. So they're kind of creating virtual reality for the masses so that people can, you know, and this is without having looked at it super carefully. But what I understand is it's going to make it all the more easy. And I got a coworker who loved the idea. He's got virtual reality goggles. So I have a lot of my background from him. He thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread. He plays video games of virtual reality. He, he, goes around the world on these virtual tours, looking at waterfalls and hikes and all kinds of stuff and in cities in Europe. And he just thinks everyone should have one. It's almost better than going there because it's free, but it feels real. Does it really feel real? 
Well, in terms of the, the, if you're used to playing with them for just a little while, your your brain sort of adjusts, and it and in terms of visually, it's stimulating to the senses, and it feels like you're there. It's like 4K video. It looks great. So yeah. now, what I just saw about this is they're also making um, sensory feedback to go along with it. So he's got a sensory feedback on his computer chair that that vibrates his chair, like when a bomb blows up or whatever in video games, his chair moves and gives that sensory feedback, right? So now they're talking about these different modules that you can buy and clothes that you can put on to give you um, that sensory, besides the visual, the sensory uh, perception that you're really there. So, you know, you're going to have good sound, you're going to have good visuals. There might be a module that is capable of reproducing common smells you know maybe you'll put a like a like an ink packet like you put in your printer with different colors of ink perhaps you would put those into this device and out of these five substance packs it's able to regenerate in a close proximity different smells right smells of flowers smells of coffee and you can combine these things to generate i don't know but the point is they're trying to make it immersive so it feels very real. Well, it's really easy to push a deception upon people when the world is buying into this en masse. Isn't this fun? Isn't this exciting? Mm-hmm. Right? It's like it's like multi- massively multiplayer video games. You can you can all go on a tour together. You can all have a virtual experience together as a group. Mm-hmm. And people will more and more be happy with being locked down and stuck at home. And it'll also make it easier to worship the beast. To worship the beast, to push false narratives. Yes. They'll be they'll they will get used to being fed a narrative mm-hmm. and having the experience look real. Exactly. I mean virtual I mean virtual reality, I'm sorry, CG mm-hmm. is already uh, very impressive. They can already simulate a lot of things to make it look almost indistinguishable. So, I know. Very I, I, dangerous, I'm, guys. I'm really worried about my grandchildren because my son always makes, allows them to to play with their tablet and everything. And they're constantly on the phone and, you know, playing games, video games. And I'm just like, yeah. I'm just so worried. I'm, I'm going to have to have a talk with my son and be like, do not whatever you do. Well, he told me that, um, you know, Liam, my oldest grandson. He's not my biological grandson, but my son, Jeremy, um, married his mother. So he's, you know, we treat him like he's our biological. But Liam goes to visit his biological dad and his dad bought him one of those virtual reality glasses. Because it's a cool toy and it will make it easier to keep his child busy so that he can do his own thing and not really participate in his son's life when his son is there. So disturbing. Sounds mean, but it's the it's the fact. Yes. So uh, Barb mentions like Wally, yeah, like those people who are just um, in the in the cartoon Wally. If you haven't seen it, it's really good. What's that? It's fun. Um, but yeah, people they became so lazy and so um, bought into their virtual world and that they were all sit there in chairs and they they lost most of their bone and were just these fat blobs with virtually no bones in them. Really? Yeah. Um, and then uh, Jason says, you will own nothing and be happy. Yeah. And boy, if that's not true. Right. <sighs> I mean, that even takes you back to um, what's the movie with Keanu Reeves? Um, oh, the Matrix. Yeah. Right. It's not exactly the same, but where they had. What about that humans. island with that island with uh, Scarlett Johansson and Ewan with that guy's. E- what is his name? E- I can't pronounce his name. It's like. I don't know. But I was going to finish saying that it's like when they're plugged into the Matrix, they're all, you know, lying down in this goo with a, mil- with a million cables plugged into them, providing nutrients and all this stuff and taking away the excrement. And, you know, they're basically energy sources for the machine. Wow. Human energy sources. Wow. Um, but they didn't know, right? Mm-mm-mm. That's going extra far, but, you know, it's a similar kind of thing. Crazy. Uh, I mean, shut us up and keep us in agreement. All right, you guys. All right. Shabbat shalom. All right. Love you guys. Shalom.
you who will bless you and keep you, you who will make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, you who will lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. We hope you've enjoyed today's broadcast and that you are encouraged in your walk with Messiah. For more teachings, subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell to be notified of our latest content. Visit Maria's many blogs at doubleportioninheritance.com. That's doubleportioninheritance.com. This ministry is made possible by the prayers and support of listeners like you. To make a donation by PayPal or Venmo.com, use the email address doubleportioninheritance at gmail.com. That's doubleportioninheritance at gmail.com. On behalf of Maria and Gary at Double Portion Inheritance Ministries, may Yahuwah bless you.